Lucifer means like the night presents. The mythical astronomy of ice and fire. Well, it's a new, something new every week, isn't it? I don't know what you guys heard just now. It was something resembling our intro music, and it sounded like the square pusher effect took over. But at least we're not in the hall of endless mirrors, guys. At least we're not there. Um, no sound at all? Uh, yes, okay, no. I think we're good. All right, so I am Robert Plant. Obviously, this is my Robert Plant costume. Ready to take you under the sea. I am Robert Plant, the stag of the sea, if you will. And uh, joining me, of course, is after actually, you know, it's been a minute. It's it's I will say it's good to have you back, Gretchen Ellis, aka Bale the Bard. Say hello. Hey, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, good to see you all. I haven't been as available the last couple of weeks. I've been dealing with some family and life things. So um it's good to be back uh not just you know on visually on camera but good to be hanging out with you guys today on starry Wind wisdom sunday i've got my new uh it's a constellation sweater so Ooh. i feel like it's very fitting for starry wisdom i feel like it is very fitting for starry wisdom and it's fitting for gretchen ellis it's clothed fitting. clothed in starlight oh you're, oh you're 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 keeping the euron thing going on the oh, sort of yeah. quave, starry wisdom sort of vibe, you know. Kali, space between stars. Oh, look at that mug. Have we seen that before or am I just? Uh, is... Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a red dragon. You know, Joe Magician was complaining about his Game of Thrones goblet holding like literally like two shots of liquor. But that looks like a real mug. Uh, mugs to me start at like 18 ounces. So this is 20 or 22. Good. Nice. So yeah, it is my yeah. Maylie's the Red Queen mug. Yeah, that'll last all podcast long. That's good. Yes, it will. Uh, Sean E with the 420 super chat. Uh Robert Plant appreciates you, Sean E. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I saw a uh Lucifer Valerion tag. Yeah, that works too, I guess. That works too. <laughs> all right. So we are here, guys, um, with the also the hand of the dragon. As usual, the mother of Drawgons, Mallory Starshine, Mallory Sanrixian, say hello. <laughs> hello. I'm Mallory. I can't remember what a horse looks like, Dorn, today, <laughs> which is fun. But uh, yeah, I'm feeling better. Thanks for all the well wishes last week. Sorry I wasn't able to hang out with you guys at church. I missed you, but doing a lot, a lot better today. And I'm going to paint some crazy Danny Seahorse stuff for you. Yeah, we've got um, we've got some fun visual symbolism to come today so i'm looking forward to seeing what you do with it sandrix and we've plotted behind the scenes already so she knows what's coming a little bit uh steven stark glad to be back after missing a week for work steve yeah speaking of feeling better yes we're so glad you're feeling better steven stark. And happy belated birthday steven yes. yeah lots of people are feeling better lately that's good that's good stuff so thanks for the super chat there steven and hail satan <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and take these off. I don't feel like I'm um, too stoned yet. I don't need those glasses just yet. So I'm using, I've switched up my lighting a little bit. Um, I'm using my, my ring here. So it shows up pretty hard on the glasses. You get the, you can see the ring. So I'll just go with this until I feel like I'm too bloodshot. And then I'll, I'll go with the glasses. So we'll see how many 420s the podcast blows through. It's usually like the second one uh, where the glasses come back. So I vote. Second, you, you know, I never, hands? I never realized that that was why you put them on, and now I want to go back and watch and just like see if I can catch that moment. No, that's pretty much it. There's not really much more to discover. You'll, you know, <laughs> after a certain point, I start worrying about presentation. I throw the glasses on, and there it is. So, I mean, I feel like you're not close mm -hmm. enough to the camera for people to really notice all that much, unless they're also sitting very close to their computer. But that's and if you are, you've got problems. Back up, son. This yeah, is back up <laughs> just a little bit um, and out of our business, y'all. Yeah. 
No, thanks for coming, everyone. We do appreciate it, of course. I see all the regulars in the house. That's awesome. And uh, <laughs> yep. Vic Viceria says, pay no attention to the eyes behind the glasses. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Just just listen. Look at the backdrop, <laughs> people. Look at the wigs. Look at the look at the silly look at those headgear. silly horns. Look at the silly monkey. That mm. that's what the headgear is for too. It's another distraction. Oh, it's all a distraction. <laughs> why? Why would an eight foot tall Wookie live on Kishig with two foot tall Ewoks? That does not make sense. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I've broken out the Chewbacca defense. Uh, so we are here with a new podcast here today, guys. It is Weird Compendium Eight. A silver seahorse, and it is going to be a Val Valerian spectacular indeed. So it's going to be good. Oh, Pegleg Pete says I'm life size. All right. Ah! <laughs> that was for Pegleg Pete. That was like really intense for him. It's I watch him on the TV sometimes, um, mm -hmm. and sometimes my SO will bring it up when we're live. And he hasn't trolled the chat yet, but one day it's coming. So brace for impact, chat. Yeah, one of these days, Elodia will drop some distractingly like cutting comment in there in the live stream, but she only spies for now. And usually not. She has better things to do, I think. But right. so good for her. Yeah, she's just the person whose roommate has a YouTube TV show in the basement and walks out <laughs> into the kitchen with like wigs and stuff on. It's great. She's like, just waking up on Sunday morning and I walk in all in a hurry, like trying to grab something. She's like, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, She's like I didn't sign up for this. Totally. Well, she did sign up for this. She knows what she got into. She knew I played bass before we got married. So I mean, so that's... that should explain the wigs, right? Oh, that's a, that's as much of a disclaimer as you can get. So, <laughs> um, real quickly, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the uh, I've been mentioning a between two weirwoods with gray area that is going to be next week. Um, like 90% sure we're just making sure everyone's scheduled to get confirmed, but that's looking good. And now it's actually uh, mutated into a full panel on memory, sorrow, and thorn. Um, the Tad Williams series and the influence on a song of ice and fire. Gray is very much an expert on this. And it was her recent video on um, specifically the idea of trees and swords and poisoning trees and how that, how that interacts with uh, Song of Ice and Fire. Turns out Aziz is a big Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn fan, so he's going to join us. And also Bookshelf Stud. Uh, hey. Yeah, Michael uh, Bookshelf Stud from the Maester Monthly Podcast and uh, he and the Crowded Couch, of course. He's been on a couple Joe Magician streams, and he's been in the fandom a long time. So looking forward to that. That is now going to be a full panel. It should be next week with uh, Bookshelf, Aziz, and, of course, Gray Area, who's kind of the curator of this i'm not a memory sorrow and thorn expert i'll be there to learn and sort of uh relate back what she's saying to a song of ice and fire because a lot of the stuff she's discovered specifically touches on a lot of the ideas that we've uh been coming to in the weirwood compendium and other places so mm -hmm. it should be a really exciting panel I'm looking forward to that yep there's a lot of good stuff in there on the use of prophecy um and how martin uses prophecy i think there's some there's a lot of interesting similarities to what's going on in memory sorrow and thorn oh are you a uh are you ahead too uh i mean i have read the books okay cool so and it's like it's almost there are certain things that are always in the back of my mind like as i'm reading through a song of ice and fire nice we'll make sure you drop anything in the chat that you have to think of or maybe hit us up on twitter this week so we can yeah that'll be exciting that line right on yeah excellent Good. All right, well, let's see here. Pull up my scripty scripty. Um, we've got some we got some new patrons to honor today. Some good friends, some myth heads, actually. In fact, and there's a new Dragon Rider patron, so we're we'll looking forward to that in just a minute. But let's go ahead and begin with the Silver Seahorse, Weird Compendium 8. Hello, friends. Hello, myth heads, YouTube viewers, podcast listeners patron supporters. Here we are, eight episodes into the Weirwood Compendium. Eleven, really, since we should include the Weirwood Goddess episodes in this body of work as well. Yes, here we are, all these episodes into our study of Weirwoods, and I thought I'd play one of the hits, one of the old goodies. By that I mean we're going to start off today with a bit of Morningstar discussion. Familiar topic, I know. Lately we've been studying Daenerys as a Nissa Nissa figure who symbolically goes into the green sea of the Weirwood Net in all manner of clever ways. And the celestial equivalent to this involves 
the mythology of the planet Venus in general and the Greek goddess Aphrodite in particular. To wit, Daenerys and Nissanissa symbolize the second moon that cracked open to birth dragons, <clears throat> and their real or symbolic deaths symbolize the burning and cracking open of the moon. Before they die, they are equivalent to the moon goddess, and after they die, or symbolically die, they represent the falling stars made up of the moon's corpse, my beloved moon meteors. They're no longer moon goddesses now, they're falling stars, and as falling stars, George has chosen to see them as equivalent to Venus, who appears to fall from the horizon every night when it is in the even star position, as we know. From moon to morning star, I know I've talked about this many times, but I just want it to be super clear in your mind before we start. Plus, I think it's one of the more brilliant things that Martin has done with mythical astronomy symbolism, and I do love talking about it. <clears throat> the myth of Venus is probably familiar to you by now. Oronos's son, Kronos, cut off his balls, not sent his balls, and threw them down from heaven and into the sea. This made the sea foamy where they landed. Ooh, the la. And from this sea foam was born Aphrodite, whose name famously means foam born. At least that's what Hesiod, the famous Greek poet and storyteller and mythographer said. He traced her name to Aphros, which means sea foam. And some scholars, uh, though some scholars dispute that. Uh, it makes sense to me though, since Aphrodite is unquestionably associated with Venus and Venus appears to both fall from heaven to the horizon as the even star, and it also appears to rise from the horizon as the morning star. If you lived surrounded by the ocean on three sides, as most Greeks did, then these fallings and risings would appear to incur, uh, would these fallings and risings would appear to occur into and out of the sea. Uh, aphros, the Greek word aphros, covers the first part of the word Aphrodite, and scholars in the early 19th century who accepted Hesiod's analysis of Aphrodite's name suggested that the second half of Aphrodite might be traced to Odite, which is O-D-I-T-E, with some squiggly marks above it. And that means wanderer, or D-I-T-E, Dite, which means bright. So wanderer and bright. And again, I would cautiously venture to say, in my very non-expert opinion, that this kind of makes sense. I mean, the whole idea of this myth is that a star, a bright wanderer, appears to fall into and rise from the sea, from the sea foam. Now, all of this is in dispute, although there actually isn't really a strong alternative explanation for what Aphrodite means. But I just want to give you all the necessary disclaimers and updates on scholarly debates. And if you want to check out the uh, links to the scholars who make these various arguments, then you can find all that on the Wikipedia entry for Aphrodite. And of course, the great thing about Wikipedia is that it always has tons of links so that whatever you read there or question, you can go and check out and see where they got it. So there we go. So that's Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. She rises from the sea foam created by Oronos's severed balls falling into the sea. Sorry, I just can't say balls without using the not Santa's balls voice. You'll just have to just have to allow me that. Uh, so you. You can see how well this works for Martin's basic mythical astronomy idea, that of a moon goddess being slain by a comet and falling into the sea, after which she rises and transforms like Aphrodite rising from the sea. The sea serves as a metaphor for the weirwood net, of course, and indeed, Nissa Nissa dies and goes into the green sea just as the moon meteors fall into the sea. She also seems to be reborn from the weirwood net sea, just as Aphrodite is born from the sea foam. And think of the symbolism of Lady Stoneheart here, who was reborn from the green fork of the trident and then took up residence in a green seer-like cave full of weirwood roots. Now backing up a bit, the very concept of Azor High as a hero reborn in the sea on a certain level is just Martin pointing at the Venus component of the Azor High myth. Lightbringer is synonymous with Venus as well as Lucifer. Um, Sorry, let me back up. I got distracted by the chat there. Let me just check on, oh, Isabel with the pole star. Yep, okay, uh, let's see here. So backing up a bit, the very concept of Azor High as a hero reborn in the sea on a certain level is just Martin pointing at the Venus component of the Azor High myth. Lightbringer, the word Lightbringer, is synonymous with Venus as well as Lucifer. And so the rebirth of Azor High, who's reborn to wield Lightbringer, 
is akin to Venus rising from the sea, hence Azor Ahai being a hero reborn from the sea. Azor Ahai is also resurrected through the Weirwood Net, at least it seems to us, which Martin imagines as a green sea. So in this way, you can see how nicely Morningstar mythology dovetails with the idea of going into and coming out of the green sea of the Weirwoods. We already identified the falling moon goddess and all other moon meteor symbols, basically all the Lightbringer symbols, as drawing on the morning star and even star mythology. And as we've continued our research, we've come to see that all the Azor Ahai, Nissa Nissa, and Lightbringer stuff seems inextricably linked to the Weirwoods. Ergo, I thought it was worthwhile to circle back to lovely Venus one more time and show how Martin has joined that symbolism with the Green Sea and Green Seer ideas. The overarching symbolic themes that we'll be discussing today will be dragons going into the Weirwood Net, and more specifically, Nissa Nissa merging with and becoming the Green Sea of the Weirwood Net. And Daenerys will be the dragon and the Nissa Nissa performing all of the symbolism in the scenes we'll examine today. She's a moon goddess turned morning star, and she's falling into and rising from the sea pretty much constantly. But before we throw Danny into the ocean, let's take a look at the famous nod to Aphrodite George slips in to one of Danny's A Dance with Dragons chapters, just in case you haven't heard it in a while. This is Danny asking her handmaidens to send Dario to her. Send him up at once, and I will have no more need of you this evening. I shall be safe with Dario. Oh, and send Eri and Jiqui, if you would be so good, and Missande. I need to change to make myself beautiful. She said as much to her handmaids when they came. What does your grace wish to wear? asked Missande. Starlight and sea foam, Danny thought. A wisp of silk that leaves my left breast bare for Dario's delight. Oh, and flowers for my hair. When first they met, the captain brought her flowers every day, all the way from Yunkai to Marine. Bring the gray linen gown with the pearls on the bodice. Oh, and my white lion's pelt. She always felt safer wrapped in Drogo's lion skin. Excellent. Thank you, Gretchen. The reading voice sounds lovely today. Let me just mess with my windows here for a second. By the way, guys, I have posted... Uh, this essay, it is public. The link to it is in the description of this video. However, I will drop it in the chat right now. I know some of you guys do like to read along. So there you go. All right, so as you just heard in that quote, Danny wants to wear starlight and sea foam. Now the classic translation of Aphrodite is sea foam slash bright wanderer. And Danny wants to wear starlight and sea foam to make herself beautiful. Danny is referred to as the most beautiful woman in the world by two of her suitors, Quentin and Victarion. So Aphrodite, the Aphrodite reference really sticks. Consider the flowers in her hair also. That's basically like the flower crown worn by the woman named the Queen of Love and Beauty at a Westeros attorney, especially since it's her hunky love interest Dario who gives her the flowers as the tourney champion bestows the floral crown to whomever he chooses as the queen of love and beauty. But Aphrodite is the goddess of love and beauty, and she's associated with springtime and the growth of vegetation. So we can see the logic in George giving Danny a symbolic queen of love and beauty flower crown when comparing her to Aphrodite. She wants to leave one breast bare for Dario's delight. That's an obvious nod to the bear your breast to me part of the Lightbringer Nissa Nissa legend. And the gray and white attire with pearls is clear lunar symbolism to go along with it. In other words, Danny is a moon maiden waiting to become a morning star. And the moon goddess does that by coupling with the sun and his big explosive comet. Ah, yes, that's right. So I'd like to stop and say thank you to Stanley Black for our intro music. Thank you to um, John Walsh for our flamenco music, which you're about to hear. Thank you to Gretchen Ellis for reading the quotes today. Thank you to San Rixian for joining us this week and every week and bringing her wonderful art to the community. Thanks to George R. Martin for writing the books. And thanks most of all to you lovely patrons. And let me just stop and say a minute. Um, I, you know, I don't talk about this a lot. A lot of people say, you know, you know, uh, your patron dollars help the show go on and upward. And I guess I kind of think that sort of goes without saying, but 
specifically like some of the things I have done with your Patreon money. Um, two years ago, my computer died on me. I was only able to buy a new computer instantly because of you guys. Um, you know, the new lighting that I have. Um, I've ordered these fun banners, got them on the cheap. They're only like 20 bucks a banner, but I got like six of them, you know? So that came out of the mythical astronomy budget. Um, microphone, sound interface. Uh, these things occasionally need to be updated or upgraded, and that all comes from Patreon. Um, I've had to increase the bandwidth uh, of my podcast because I'm putting out so many podcasts. I'm putting out like three or even four podcasts a month now, and I've got a second feed for Between Two Weirwoods. All of that costs money, and all of that was paid for by you lovely patrons. So if you are not a patron, um, you're welcome to enjoy the show for free, but at least take a moment to give a little moment of appreciation for our patrons because our patrons are making all this happen. So thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure you guys have noticed, like I was saying, the increase in podcast. You know, this time last year, I was doing basically one a month. And now you're getting, you know, like I said, three a month. Some of them are live discussion panels with other brilliant myth heads like Gretchen and San Rixian. And you guys know all the rest. Maester Mary and Melanie Lot 7 and Painkiller Jane and Amanda Crowfood's daughter and, you know, all the folks. So thanks, everybody. I won't go on and on, but I just want to say, you know, it's not just, you know, it, it helps to spell it out, I guess, instead of just saying, oh, send me, send me money. Thank you very much. Here I am. But like, no, there's, there's a lot of brass tacks that go into this and you guys finance it all. So thank you very much. And speaking of patrons. Beloved Melanie Lot 7, a content creator in her own right. It's a longtime mythical astronomy patron. And she recently has become a dragon. That's right. She is now a dragon patron. And so it is time for the unveiling of the dragon name of Melanie Lot 7. Just want to yes. build up the anticipation. Woo! Drum roll. Yeah, let me cue up the music, though, because we, we want to get this to music. The backwards flamenco is a big hit, so I'm just going to roll with that. <clears throat> is Melanie in the chat? First, let me just make sure. Is she here or, or is she? She might have kids uh, stuff going on today. So she's, that's kind of the ultimate excuse. To um... I mean, she definitely has kids. You said that in a really funny way that made it sound like maybe she might have kids. A kid stuff today. Stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, she definitely has kids. She definitely has kids. She might have... Uh, um obligations uh zoom zoom with the super chat thank you very much zoom zoom appreciate that you're pretty consistent with those uh with those ten dollars super chats so i appreciate that we chicken just lipstick. Got one. yep From uh chicken thank lipstick. you for your hard work working out the budget to become a patron yeah very <clears throat> much appreciated you know whatever you can spare and if uh you know if times are tight and you can't be a patron i totally that's cool feel free to enjoy the enjoy the program for free you can help us out by liking and just sharing it far and wide you know Put a little iTunes review. Make sure you're subscribed. Tell your friends, that kind of stuff. All right, here we go. Oh, I wasn't hearing it. Oh, that's right. Uh, it got all staticky. I got to unplug and plug it in. And then hopefully this will work right. Mm. There we go. This next section is dedicated to Malaris, the weird dragon, whose scales are white as bone and whose horns, wing bones, and spinal crest are as red as blood. Malaris, who is native to Stigai, is the first known Stygian dragon to leave that corpse city at the heart of the shadow in over five millennia. It is rumored that Malaris is inhabited by the spirit of a long vanished sorceress from Ashai called Melanie Lotse. Oh, I like. I like it. She's gonna love Excellent. it. Oh my gosh, I'm excited for her to hear it. Yeah, she'll she'll like that when she uh, when she gets to it. So, yeah, Pablo, I'm sorry. That would be nice if I had a technical person sitting around next to me to like work all this stuff, but uh, I don't. So, if you have like a small child or a garden gnome or something, you can send your way, uh, send my way. Uh, I'll be happy to put him to work, but. 
I'm kidding, Gretchen. I'm kidding. Labor small, laws. Come on. A small child. Yeah, like, yeah like second or third, you know, like they're not going to inherit. You're not going to send them to the wall. The be second sons tech. become, yeah, the second sons become sound techs. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Let's get this thing on track. Let's get this thing on track. Uh, I do want to. Um, uh, oh, it looks like there's a beautiful picture of a Starte in my uh in the essay let's see if i can screen share it there we go hang on one second guys this is one of my favorite uh images of astarte because it has amethyst eyes as you can see pretty fun stuff and an amethyst belly button for whatever reason but you can see the uh the lunar crescent as you know as a pair of horns on top because she is the uh the bovine lunar virgin if you will and she got the amethyst eyes it's a big influence on uh Daenerys and the whole amethyst empress idea and just in case i'm not being clear astarte ishtar um they are big influences on aphrodite it's not quite a one for one thing uh but they're both morning star goddesses and Aphrodite definitely draws a lot from Astarte and Ishtar. So it it might be the the amethyst navel might oh, don't quote me on this, but it may very well be a euphemism for her vulva. Ah. You heard it here um, first. That quote is Gretchen Ellis, that's a fact. Uh yeah. Well, I mean, in Hebrew, uh, vul, uh navel is a euphemism for vulva so i imagine it's probably a common ancient eastern thing so i don't know if that's what's going on there but that could very well be that was just my first thought so that navel overflowing with wine you got vulva on the mind gretchen <laughs> sorry damn wow uh, <laughs> way to call me out like this mallory <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> uh, I thought of Steven Universe, so put me in that shame box and I'll stay quiet the rest of the stream. I mean, that's a good um, one. They've got jewels for... I don't, I don't know anything about it other than they're magic children or something and they have belly button jewels. Not all right. of them have belly button, belly button jewels. They okay. have gems. They're well, variously it's getting, placed. It's We're under the sea, but it's getting steamy in here. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't even know how that's possible, but... Joseph Newhouse sends in a $10 super chat. Appreciate the show. You inspired me to start reading Fire and Blood like two thirds of the way through now. Cool. You must have enjoyed our Fire and Blood panel. Look forward to further symbolic secrets as well as mythical lore. Thanks, Joseph. I've seen your name a bunch. So thanks for being a myth head. There you are. You're a myth head now. I just. Bloop. You have just been dubbed. Head. Yeah. You better get on Twitter if you're not. <laughs> I'll harass you on there. By the way, somebody uh, joined Twitter this morning and tagged me and was like, hey, Elamella, join Twitter because you've been talking about it. And I quickly retweeted them out and they got a bunch of followers now, or at least they got some Mythhead followers. So if you, if you get on Twitter, make sure you tag me at the Dragon Elamel and I will, we will draw you into the circle quickly. I mean, Ooh, if that's what you me. want, if you want to be in the circle, you don't have to be. But if you want to be, we will well, bring you in. Yeah, well, you can try to get your 10 foot pole out, but we'll grab that pole and be like, yeah. Too bad. You belong here now. Uh, One of us. The One euphemisms. of us. The euphemisms. Okay, we better get some content out or I'll lose some of these 175 viewers who have blessed us with their presence today. Thank you, viewers. All right, so this first section is called Melting into the Sea. Melty, melty. Get out your grilled cheese sandwiches. The vast majority of... Day uh, what? Was that more corny than my usual jokes? or No, no, keep going. Okay. Right. You're doing great. I love grilled cheese sandwiches too, by the way. It's very good. That's what I think of when I say melty. The vast majority of Danny's green sea symbolism happens in the actual Dothraki Sea, of course. And that's something that we saw in Weirwood Compendium 7, uh, which was called, what was the name of it? Daenerys the Sea Dreamer. That's right. But when I looked back at our first two chapters before she enters the Dothraki Sea, I actually did find that right from the beginning, Danny appears to us as a sort of watery goddess. Her very first chapter opens like this. Her brother held up the gown for her inspection. This is beauty. Touch it. Go on. Caress the fabric. Danny touched it. The cloth was so smooth that it seemed to run through her fingers like water. It's a beautiful gown made of water. That's good. 
Very practical. After this comes the cringeworthy scene where Viserys gropes his sister's breasts and then twists one of her nipples painfully. This is showing right from the start that this is obviously an abusive relationship, and it's also a reference to Nissa Nissa bearing her breast to Azor High and being stabbed by Lightbringer, just as with all the other times that Viserys does something, less, something like this to her, and it happens like at least three times, I think. Um, it's basically the unkind version of the scene with Dario that we just quoted in the intro. Uh, so Danny's next move is, by the way, I'll just stop and say, you know, we always talk about how the whole Nissa Nissa thing is depicted sometimes as a willing thing and sometimes as like, you know, like a rape or a murder or something, you know, unwilling. And so, you know, here we have Dan Danny in one scene willingly leaving her breast bare for Dario, like Nissa Nissa in the myth, willingly bearing her breast. Uh, but then we see Viserys, you know, going after her breast in an antagonistic fashion. Um, so once again, Martin leaves us to wonder what was the original situation, but I just thought I'd point that out. Okay, so Danny's next move is to take a bath. We feel you, Danny. Viserys scenes make us all want to bathe. This is the famous scalding hot bath scene that you probably remember from the TV show, the one where she shows a bit of her future ability, occasional ability, to tolerate heat and fire. As we discussed last time, Danny takes a lot of baths in pivotal scenes, including a couple of fiery baths. And here's the line from this one in the first chapter. The water was scalding hot, but Daenerys did not flinch or cry out. She liked the heat. It made her feel clean. Besides, her brother had often told her that it was never too hot for a Targaryen. Ours is the house of the dragon, he would say. The fire is in our blood. So she's given a gown made of water. She takes a hot bath, and afterward, the girl brushed her hair until it shone like molten silver. Not only is this symbolism wet and hot, ay caramba, it's also generally evocative of silvery moon goddess mystique. She even checks out her molten silver hair in a silver looking glass, which is conveniently round like a full moon. In her second chapter, which includes her wedding, we get this passage. Afterward, she could not say how far or how long they had ridden, but it was full dark when they stopped at a grassy place beside a small stream. Drogo swung off his horse and lifted her down from hers. She felt as fragile as glass in his hands, her limbs as weak as water. This is the scene where Drogo and Danny first have sex, and it's notable that it occurs by a stream. And look, Danny is made of water. Glass, too, and since she's a dragon, this might be a suggestion of dragon glass. Although I think Martin is mainly using the word glass here for the more conventional purpose of portraying Danny as feeling nervous and weak and uh, fragile, I guess you'd say. Uh, the watery legs description works well to that ends too, but also contributes to the other watery associations that we find all around Danny. I have to wonder if George is making a tall drink of water joke here since she's like glass and water. I mean, Drogo is definitely a tall drink of water, so I guess Danny is like a short glass of water. I don't know. Anyways, people made of water can melt. Moon maidens, especially, we expect them to melt. We just saw Danny with molten silver hair, which sounds melty. And in the last Weirwood Compendium episode, we saw Danny submerse herself in the green grass sea and become one with it, losing herself in the green. And that's kind of like melting, certainly. The concept there seemed to be that Nissa Nissa dies and then not only enters the realm of the Green Seers, but in some senses merges with and becomes the thing that we think of as the Weirwood Net. Melting Moon Maidens are expressing the exact same concept. We've seen this same idea expressed using the symbol of blood. You'll recall Jorah's fine dissertation on the various kinds of grasses in the world, including that bit about the Dothraki Sea turning into a sea of blood when it blooms. I interpreted that as a reference to the shed blood of the Moon Maiden entering the Green Sea, which of course amounts to Nissa Nissa merging with the Green Sea of the Weirwood Nut after she's slain. To show you why I made that interpretation, we then looked at two scenes that take place in the Green Dothraki Sea, where Danny symbolically has her blood boiled and melted. There's the dragon dream where she could feel her flesh sear and blacken and slough away, could feel her blood boil and turn to steam. And then there's the alchemical wedding, where she had the urge to run to Drogo in the pyre and 
take him inside her one last time, the fire melting the flesh from their bones until they were as one forever. These are both lightbringer forging scenes in the Green Sea that bring death transformations for Danny. I mean, one is the bloody alchemical wedding, and the other is a dream of being burnt by a dragon, which would simply be the moon's eye view of the oncoming comet, more or less. In both scenes, Nissa Nissa is melted, and her blood is specifically mentioned as boiling. Heck, even the Lightbringer myth itself suggests Nissa Nissa's blood as being boiled and melted. Nissa Nissa famously got stabbed by Lightbringer, and elsewhere, in the pages of the Jade Compendium, actually, we hear about what happens when you get stabbed with Lightbringer. Once Azora High fought a monster. When he thrust the sword through the belly of the beast, its blood began to boil. Smoke and steam poured from its mouth. Its eyes melted and dribbled down its cheeks, and its body burst into flame. Nissa Nissa certainly isn't a monster, but you can't imagine the same thing happening to our poor moon maiden when she was stabbed with the white-hot Lightbringer. And thus we can see that the idea of Nissa Nissa melting is at least hinted at right in the original tale of Lightbringer's forging. Perhaps the most clear expression of this symbolic bleeding and melting idea of the moon maiden uh, was the one involving Ygritte that we found two episodes ago in Weirwood Compendium 6, The Devil in the Deep Green Sea. We're going to take a minute to go over this again because it's really important. Now, this was John's dream of swimming in a hot pool beneath the heart tree of Winterfell's godswood, where Ygritte's flesh melts and dissolves into the pool. You know nothing, Jon Snow, she whispered, her skin dissolving in the hot water, the flesh beneath sloughing off her bones until only skull and skeleton remained, and the pool bubbled thick and red. Ygritte, as we know, is a terrific red-headed weirwood goddess. And as a spearwife, she even brings that cool Melii ash tree nymph symbolism to life. Since you'll recall from the Venus of the Woods episode that the Melii ash tree nymphs armed their sons with uh, ashwood spears from their sacred ash trees. The Melii were also created by Oronos's chopped off balls, by the way, just like Aphrodite. So they're kind of like half-brothers of Aphrodite. <clears throat> So it's cool. It's a Venus connection to the Melii. <clears throat> Ygritte's name also contains a clear allusion to the, uh, to the root word of Yggdrasil, Ig. And Ygritte may be intended to suggest Ig right, since that would seem to be a good description of the idea of killing Nissa Nissa as a part of a magic rite to allow Azor Ahai to enter the Weirwood Net. You may also recall there's an ancient Ironborn myth where they seem to refer to Weirwoods as the demon tree, Ig, which is essentially Martin tapping us on the shoulder and making sure that we know to associate the weirwoods with Yggdrasil. And thus it's no coincidence that he named one of his weirwood goddesses, uh, one of his Nissa Nissa weirwood goddess figures after old Iggy. Sorry, I'm gonna read that sentence again. Uh, and thus it's no coincidence that he named, and thus it's no coincidence that he named one of the weirwood goddess Nissa Nissa figures after old Iggy. Two other weirwood goddess figures, Asha Greyjoy and the wildling spearwife named Rowan, are both named after the ash tree, which is what Yggdrasil is, a great ash tree. And this provides further context for Ygritte as Ig right. So here's Ygritte in front of Martin's version of the Ig tree, herself looking a bit like the weirwood anyway, with her red hair. And then she melts, with only her bones and blood remaining, and the blood fills the hot pool. Not only is she melting into the weirwood pool, we know that blood and bone is the frequently used description of the weirwoods. So the idea of her turning into a weirwood is suggested in more than one way in the scene. As with Danny's various submersions and meltings and boilings in the green Dothraki Sea, the message seems to be that Nissa Nissa, when slain, becomes one with the green sea, so to speak. She turns to blood and dissolves into the green sea. I especially like the way that the Ygritte scene unites the bathing symbolism with the bleeding and melting symbolism. And again, I would suggest that all of Danny's symbolically rich scalding hot baths are getting at the same idea, hence her molten silver hair. We see Danny's silver hair again play the role of a melting moon when she bathes after Rago's stillbirth near the end of A Game of Thrones. And of course, this is also right before she walks into the pyre and wakes the dragons. When she was clean, her handmaids helped her from the water. 
Eerie and Jiqui fanned her dry, while Doria brushed her hair until it fell like a river of liquid silver down her back. Notice that her hair is not only like, whoops, I've muted my screen. One second. Here I am. I'm no longer the great eye. Notice her hair is not only like melting silver, but like a falling river of liquid silver, like a molten silver waterfall. One imagines a moon melting right out of the sky and dripping down to earth, melty, melty. There's even a third matching line about her hair being like wet silver, and it comes when Danny hears the story of the destruction of the second moon while sitting in a bath, that's right. It's actually nestled right in the folds of the famous moon dragon myth itself. Silvery wet hair tumbled across her eyes as Danny turned her head, curious. The moon? He told me the moon was an egg, Khaleesi, the Lysini girl said, and you know the rest. Notice the world, uh, notice the world, blah, blah. notice the word tumbled. I mean, it did tumble the world, Freudian slip. Notice the word tumbled to imply the wet, silvery moon hair falling from the sky or melting across the face of the moon maiden. This melting moon language is nicely paired here with the talk of a moon scalded and cracked open like an egg, and also with Daenerys the moon maiden sitting in a hot scalding bath. If you notice, the bath she sits in right before she wakes the dragons was called Scalding Hot, previewing Danny's role as the moon egg that was scalded by the sun when she walks into the pyre. With all these rivers of molten silver dripping off of Danny's head into the bath, that bath might soon be a silver sea. A very small one and a very small joke, but it is true that the Dothraki grass sea used to be an inland sea. Uh, and in, I'm sorry. Um, but it is true that the Dothraki grass sea used to be an inland sea, which was called the Silver Sea, and it was actually huge. A silver sea is an obvious symbol for the moon itself, especially when we have Danny the Moon Maiden's silver hair melting like that in these three scenes. More on the Silver Sea in a moment, but for now, think about it as a very large version of the reflective moon pool in Bravos, which is itself a larger version of the silvered looking glass in Danny's first chapter. Uh, okay, I'm getting requests for Sanry check in here. Oh, yes, you're making progress quickly today. Oh, hello. I am here. <laughs> Listening about the sea and Danny going into the sea and molten <sighs> silver just as I'm painting it. So good timing. Nice. And mm -hmm. there is actually, don't explain what you're drawing just yet because there's a specific correlation that we're going to, that you're going to see in just a minute. All, all I said was hair. No, okay. no, 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 you're good. You're good. <laughs> um, I'm just, but yeah, there's, there's a little bit of a reveal coming. So okay. anyways, we'll be back. This looks awesome. <clears throat> so As consider always. the, consider the hair symbolism of the Nissa Nissa. By the way, I never mind people asking to see the sand redrawing. So that's always welcome. Uh, let's see. Okay. Consider the hair symbolism of the Nissa Nissa maidens that we've studied. Most of them actually have red kissed by fire hair, which is a great way to symbolize the burning of the second moon. It's also a great way to create the image of a burning tree person that alludes to the weirwoods, whose red leaf canopy looks like blood and fire. Danny doesn't have kissed by fire hair, of course, but rather the silvery gold hair of Valeria. But then that's the whole point of describing her silver hair as either molten or liquid silver. It's simply a different way of showing a burning and melting moon with hair symbolism. And that's just symbolism. You'll recall there's actually two scenes where Danny's hair literally burns off talk about kissed by a fire, that's making the symbolism literal. Danny's hair burns off both at the alchemical wedding and during the escape from the Marinese fighting pit on Drogon's back, both scenes which symbolize the burning of the moon to forge Lightbringer dragons. One scene happens in the Dothraki Sea and the other as Danny is escaping into the Dothraki Sea. So once again, we can see that George is using the green Dothraki Sea as a backdrop to show all these moon maidens aren't just melting, but melting into the green sea of the Weirwood Net. At the end of Danny's first chapter, Illyrio guides her and Viserys to Cal Drogo's manse, which is the temporary home that the Pentoshi happily keep for him when he comes here, which is part of their strategy for avoiding strife with the Dothraki. There we find some really awesome silvery moon symbolism. They stepped past the eunuch into a pillared courtyard overgrown in pale ivy. Moonlight painted the leaves in shades of bone and silver as the guests drifted among them. 
Thanks, Mr. Mobius. Appreciate that. I see you there. So this would be the first of many instances of Martin giving us moonlight, silvering things in the moonlight, usually white things like weirwood bark or gold things like Jamie's hair and armor at the Battle of the Whispering Wood, which is all about weirwoods too. For example, when Arya practices her sword play by night in the Harrenhal Godswood, it says, the light of the moon painted the limbs of the weirwood silvery white. In fact, the pale ivy here at uh, Drogo's Mance is painted in shades of silver and bone. And of course, bone white is by far the most common description of the weirwood wood. How much wood could a weirwood wear if a weirwood could wear wood? I don't know. Probably a lot. They get really big. They grow forever. We'll work on it. We'll work on it. Uh, let's see. It makes a ton of sense to see moon and weirwood colors appearing together, of course, since weirwoods have a ton of lunar symbolism, as we know from the moon door in the Eerie, the house of black and white weirwood door, and the black gate weirwood face that glows like milk and moonlight. The occasion for this gathering is actually Drogo and Danny's engagement. Now, to me, the silver and bone in the moonlight ivy here seems like kind of a subtle way to tie Azor High and Nissa Nissa's wedding symbolized here by Drogo and Danny, to the weirwoods and the moon. And of course, that's an idea that we're already on to. Drogo and Danny's wedding and their consummation takes place uh, in the green grass right outside of Pentos. So it's kind of on the edge of the green sea. So it's all fairly consistent. Or you could simply look at it this way. Drogo, the solar king, found his Nissa Nissa among the silver and bone foliage of the garden on the edge of the green sea. The pale ivy looked painted in silver and bone by the moonlight. How do you think freaking Daenerys looked? Like a silvery white tree goddess, I'd imagine. That is, if this scene actually happened, which it didn't because it's fantasy. But she would have looked like a tree goddess. So there you go. Moving on to Danny's second chapter, we find a nice introduction of the Dothraki's status as honorary sea people. A mighty earthen ramp had been raised amid the grass palaces, and there Danny was seated beside Caldrogo above the seething sea of Dothraki. Hold on, I'm refuting Tom Cruise's vile calumny in the chat there. Okay, let's see. They are sea people who come from the Dothraki Sea, as you can see. I mean, they did choose Jason Momoa, the Cal Drogo actor, to play Aquaman, did they not? Case closed. And of course, jokes aside, Poseidon, uh, the god of the sea, is strongly, strongly associated with horses. So there is a very cool seahorse, Cal Drogo, Aquaman, Poseidon kind of milieu happening there, I guess. That's what I call it. I call it a milieu. Cultural milieu. So the Dothraki are seamen, as you can see. On a more serious note, many have noticed the Dothraki's philosophical similarities with the Ironborn. The Dothraki do not sow, like the Greyjoys, and in fact the Dothraki even believe that farming is some sort of defilement of Mother Earth. Viserys says that all these savages know how to do is steal things that better men have made and kill. And excepting for the bigoted and ignorant use of the word savage, which is meant to make us see Viserys as being constantly shitty, he does have kind of a point. The Dothraki do indeed steal everything, almost as a point of pride, just as. And paying coin for nice. Was there a... something happened? There was, was a glitch there a... on my end. Okay, I yeah. got a glitch where you just like froze for a second. Where did you, what was the last thing you heard? Um, the series uh, the... is constantly shitty. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, so start with the next sentence. The Dothraki do indeed steal everything, almost as a point of pride, just as the Ironborn take pride in paying the iron price, which just means stealing. And they even cast shame on paying money for nice things, as we saw with Theon and Balon. Obviously, both cultures emphasize warrior strength and tend to follow strength. And as we're about to discuss, the Dothraki are at the center of a lot of conflation between horses and boats. I mean, if you consider boats to be wooden horses, as Drogo does, then the Ironborn would be horse lords of the sea, just like the Dothraki, only not like the Dothraki. Who knows? Maybe if Danny and Vic work out something to use the Ironborn ships to ferry Danny's uh, army to Westeros, 
we'll get some amusing interplay between Victarian and some Dothraki, where they explain just why it is that you can't sell a long ship across the Great Grass Sea. We can only hope. <laughs> and Gretchen, you could comment there. I, <laughs> I think this is something that I want to see, is it not? I mean, <laughs> I would really enjoy Victarian interacting with the Dothraki a lot. Like, the, the amount of misunderstanding, like humorous misunderstanding that would go on between the two of them. We've got to have that. We, we need that. I need right. that. Right. The guy who thinks monkeys are laughing at him, like, like really <laughs> believes monkeys are laughing at him, like would, I would be great. Oh man, like, I would die. What do you mean I can't sail the Dothraki Sea? Choke, 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 kill. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can sail anything. I'm Victorian Greyjoy. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Oh. Right. Oh, that'd be great. So to sum up, Nissa Nissa is a moon goddess, and when she dies, she melts into the green sea of the Weirwood That's essentially what all of these various metaphors about bathing, melting, and burning are about. Danny and her silver hair melting in the green Dothraki Sea, while at the same time assimilating with the lords of the sea, is an especially watery version of the metaphor, and it makes a great counterbalance to all the fiery wake the dragon symbolism, which burns hot in Danny's dreams and then explodes to life at the alchemical wedding. You will recall, however, that even on the very first go-round analyzing the alchemical wedding, way back in Bloodstone Compendium number one, we did note the many watery descriptions of the fire there, such as when the dusk shimmered, as if the air itself seemed to liquefy from the heat. It's the lake of fire appearing right there at the alchemical wedding. You'll also recall from the beginning of the Weirwood Compendium, that we've interpreted one aspect of the sea dragon myth to be a memory of a giant flaming piece of moon, a bleeding star with a fiery tail, falling into the sea. Thus, you can see that this seemingly new idea of Nissa Nissa dying and going into the weirwood net was already incubating in the early mythical astronomy theories. Ravenous Reader's legendary green sea metaphor does an exquisite job of unifying the various ideas about fiery moon meteor swords and dragons plunging into the sea with the idea of a dying Nissa Nissa bringing her life and fire to the weirwood net and allows us to see them as two sides of the same coin. At the end of the day, Nissa Nissa was sacrificed around the time the moon meteors fell, which is of course right in the original Lightbringer myth, which has Nissa Nissa's death cry cracking the face of the moon. So we're about ready to go to the next section, but uh, Gretchen, let me give you a few minutes to uh, comment chime in if you will what do you think um, so far um yeah i really like everything so far um yeah i was thinking the blood the blood boiling made me think of the death of the others scene which i think is really interesting that you get um nissa nissa's death you know involving this kind of blood boiling and probably the lightbringer sword like steaming and that's exactly what we see when sam you know, kills the other, and it says that the the dragon glass was like steaming as if it was wreathed in, and the wind um, smoke too. So yep. he's mixing the smoke and the steam together, like pretty intentionally. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, smoke and steam. I think it's a really interesting that like those two things go together. Um, and also yeah. thinking about uh, Egret as like Egret, like literally like everything, like her just standing there and everything falling off. And then all you have left is a skeleton that becomes a tree. Like, it's a really interesting to think about like the weirwoods as if they're like human, petrified human, like skeletons and things. Which yeah, I and shout cool. out to Joe Magician's um, uh, White Trees, How to Make a Weirwood. I forget the exact specific title. Sammy, do you remember the specific title of that one? It's called The White Trees. The White okay. Tree, W-I-G-H-T, White. Which, by the way, that term is on loan from me. I coined that term and gave it to him, just as Joe Magician coined between two weirwoods and uh, gave it to me. So yep. we're, we're term buddies, me and Joe. Shout out to Joe Magician in general. And of course, you guys know about the Joe Magician YouTube channel. But um, uh, Gretchen, I, it was really, isn't it cool how like the Morning Star, Venus falling into the sea stuff dovetails so nicely with the... Uh, with the Danny going in or the Nissa Nissa going into the sea. When I figured that out, I was really like, oh, okay, I see what George is doing. It's pretty fun. Right. Especially because planet, like the term planet actually comes from, you know, the word for wanderer. So the idea when you have like the moon wandered too close to the sun is almost the idea of like a planet 
going out of or or looking like a planet is going out of orbit and going into the sun, which is, I mean, what Venus does. I mean, it is Venus's orbit, but it looks like you have a planet that looks like it goes into and out of the sun. Yeah. And then you have this idea of like a moon wandering too close to a sun and wandering is the term for a planet. And so the idea of like the moon and Venus being equivalent, like totally fits with that. And I think that's awesome. Yeah, that's it really. Like, that's why I wanted to harp on it again. It's like the moon becomes the, the morning star when it falls out of the sky. Right. And then it becomes this dynamic transformational figure. And since it's a falling star, it can be a fighting character. It can be a dragon. It can be Brienne with a sword. Uh, it doesn't have to be now like a, a receptor. Um, like like when the on the moon, the emphasis is on motherhood. She receives the seed and then she produces a child. But the falling right. meteor is like a transformed figure or like the child. They're now, you know, like Danny becomes the last dragon after the alchemical wedding. She becomes the Khaleesi. Yep. So yep. it's very fun, that dynamism that's going on there. Yeah. Brienne. I mean, Brienne, like, and everything to do with Tarth and how the leader of Tarth is called the morning star. You have the morning star imagery with that. And so Brienne being the heir to Tarth would become the next morning star or the even star, or is it even star? It does, but it's the same. It's the same idea. Um, so I think about the, the, you could think about the even star as giving birth to the morning star and vice versa. So Brienne's father being the even star adds to her morning star symbolism. Yep. So, but, yeah. And you see a lot of, um, you see a lot of characters do both, you know, they do the fall and the rise. So, and yep. by the way, um, a new feature, you, you guys see my under the sea backdrop here. And I was just talking about, fire going into the sea well it's time to activate the sea dragon lamp so one second guys I'm gonna sneak over here Do -do -do. the sea dragon lamp <laughs> you and positioned put it out again you position that backdrop talk loud so the screen fixes on me i'm gonna put it out now you position you that go. perfectly did you did you test it did I what? Did you test like the positioning of the backdrop so that like right on top of the palace would be where the light was? Gretchen, do I seem like the kind of guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I spent, I spent, okay, like 15, 15, 20 minutes moving it back and forth to get it. Yeah, I did. To get it perfectly right. I it mean, looks cool, right? It looks cool. It does right? look it's really, really cool. cool. It's totally worth it. I say it because I would have, I mean, I would have been doing the same thing, but like, I don't know, I got to move it slightly and just adjust it. So it's perfectly. Yep. Exactly. It was really close to begin with. So I, just, I was just tweaking it. I, I, I was like, oh, look, it's, it's coming from the tower. It's like a, <laughs> like a high tower with, with fire on top. Mm. It's the fire. And it's always summer under the sea, right? Yeah. So let's see here. Get my. Zach again. Painkiller Jane says an under the sea high tower. Which it does. Yes. I'm glad everyone's uh, amused. There you go. It does look cool, LML. Thanks, Steven. Thank you. <laughs> I thought it was cool. Oh, Thanks and by the guys. by the way, Gregory Namath, my shirt does say woman. Was asking if it just says woman over and over again in different languages. Yes, it does. So there you go. There's your answer. Various languages. All right. Let me just get my patrons ready. So, oh, yes. Mm. Okay. All right. I see what we got going on here. They are the names I need to read are really far apart. Let me just do a little copy and paste real quick here. Sandry, I like what you're doing. Thank yeah, let you. Let me go over to Sandry while I do this technical crap here. I'm trying. It's hard to paint hair. And I got a lot of weird colors going on. Yeah, there is a uh, there are a lot of interesting. Ooh, yay. It looks so cool. I'm excited. I'm excited yeah. because I know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not saying anything. She gotta be quiet. Lucy will get mad. Don't want to wake the dragon, do Don't we? Wake the dragon. Don't wake speaking the dragon. Speaking of yeah, speaking of waking the dragon, we're about to honor the anger ranger. Oh, 
Yes. Anger Ranger. Alrighty. Anger Ranger, for those of you who don't know, is uh is Questing Beast, L Questing Beast is LML's anger translator. Everyone would have found that out if if you had just waited a minute, but that's okay. <sighs> that's okay. You don't see you I don't always know what you're holding back or not. So well, I'm I'm just basically a cheap shot artist, so don't worry about it. There was no <laughs> there's no way you could have avoided it. It's not it's not you, it's me. All right, so <laughs> here we go. Oh boy. This next section is called A Silver Seahorse for a Silver Sea. And it's brought to you by our newest member of the Long Night's Watch, Tin Jack of the Dragon Glass Shield, Ghost Hunter of the Haunted Forest, and Righteous Hand of the Snow Owl. And by John Old Blackheel of House Thompson, wielder of a Valerian steel tray of fish food and Kraken tacos. And Questing Beast, the Anger Ranger, keeper of the Dragon's Wrath, and earthly avatar of Heavenly House Virgo and Libra. And uh, Joe Thompson, we actually need to pick a Zodiac sign house for you, buddy. Is Joe in the chat? He pretty much always is. Has there been a Joe Thompson sighting? I thought I saw Speak up if you're there. We've got a few. Um, we've got a few actually Zodiac houses. We had a couple people drop off and we had a couple people uh, step up from Zodiac to an even higher level. And so there are actually several houses available. So yeah, Tin Jack, what did you think? There was your name, buddy. Hope you uh, hope you liked that one. I thought it was pretty good. Tin Jack is a fan of Artemis, uh, hence the Snow Owl reference. Nice. All right. Um, oh yeah, that's right, I forgot. You're Ponderous, Joe Thompson is Ponderous Reader. Totally, so Ponderous Reader, um, let's see which what you've got is uh to choose from. We've got Ophiuchus, Gemini, Aries, Sagittarius, Scorpio, Scorpio, and Capricorn. Ah, <sighs> Capricorn. When I signed up, I Capricorn was unavailable, which is why I am a guardian of the ice dragon. But... Uh, well, ice dragon is. A different tier that's a guardian of the galaxy i know because there weren't because there were no oh uh, well yeah if you want to be capricorn uh... be the sea goat because i am a sea goat apparently even though uh, it never it never works <laughs> i am not right. a capricorn you can be whatever <laughs> sign you want because you're ball the bard hey it works so well because i'm bah. oh man bah. Let it begin. Lady Char says, no, I'm Scorpio. Oh, um, oh, uh, yes. Sorry. You can't be Scorpio. Lady Char is totally Scorpio. Oh, and that was just a ponderous, ponderous reader just said Scorpio. Uh, that's okay. Ponderous reader is a good sport. He'll roll with it. It's fine. Uh, yeah, that was my fault. I, uh, you naughty not, green sea, are you? Not updated. Not updated. <sighs> Oh well, yeah. Uh, Cra Ponderous Taco, you got some good choices there. I personally, I'd Ophiuchus well, is the one I'd be all over, but I guess everyone's. I, I, I get it. It's the Serpent Bearer. He's super cool. He's new. Yeah, totally. He's not right. a messiah. He's a very naughty boy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, back to the content. Back to the content. Um, let's see here. Uh, we are getting close to being able to explain. Uh, what we're getting close to, four twenty. Uh, what's it going to be? Eastern time? Yes, so before 20 Eastern time, about 10 minutes. So get locked and loaded, guys. Here we go. This is going to be, this is where we get going. A silver seahorse. So the other big thing that happens at the wedding that pertains to our lines of investigation is the gifting of the silver seahorse to Danny. That's where we're going to kick this essay into a full gallop. And for those of you who like House Valerian, well, you're going to be very happy. And by the way, let me do my... You've got, you two, got two coconuts. coconuts and you're banging them together. Okay, yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> no, that's sort of just <laughs> the requisite Monty Python coconut joke. Uh, yes. There's a lot to unpack here, which is basically a very dramatic understatement. So strap in or saddle up or whatever works for you. This paragraph is 
the tip of a truly titanic iceberg of symbolism. Silver glacier, if you will. She was a young filly, spirited and splendid. Danny knew just enough about horses to know that this was no ordinary animal. There was something about her that took the breath away. She was gray as the winter sea with a mane like silver smoke. Hesitantly, she reached out and stroked the horse's neck, ran her fingers through the silver of her mane. Khal Drogo said something in Dothraki and Maester Illyrio translated, Silver for the silver of your hair, the call says. That was a good Drogo voice. That was very, very, very manly and intimidating. It was good. Mm. <laughs> I don't, I have a high pitched voice. I can't really do a man voice unless I'm sick. <laughs> no, it was good. It was good. It was, a, it was about equivalent to my, uh, to my female voices. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I only really do the old ladies with any sort of skill. Everyone else is, yeah. All right. So, there are three completely awesome lines of symbolism going on here, at least. One pertains to the Grey King. One to the idea of sea horses and House Valerion, and the third to Odin's gray horse called Sleipnir. Naturally, there is some overlap because they all relate to the idea of dragons in the green sea of the Weirbunet, and specifically to Nissa Nissa's dissolution into the green sea. We'll start with the Grey King stuff. So gray is a winter sea should definitely put us in mind of the Grey King, since that is exactly the phrase used to describe his hair and beard. And as, as well as that of the Merlin King statue in White Harbor, which is just a variation of the same archetypal figure. But the horse's mane is like silver smoke, and smoke comes from fire. So there must be fire in this gray winter sea. Something fiery must have fallen into the sea, if you catch my drift. Indeed, as we just discussed, the Gray King is known for acquiring the living fire of Naga the Sea Dragon from the sea, before turning as gray as a winter sea himself. And we know that one meaning of this myth is that a fiery meteor dragon fell into the sea. Now, while the sea and smoke description of the horse implies the idea of something fiery falling in the water, when Danny climbs on the horse, she spells it out because she is the fiery moon maiden. And here I will switch to San Rixian as I continue to talk. Since it's the horse's body that looks like the winter sea and its mane that's like the silver smoke, we can even see the horse's back as the horizon line of the ocean, with Danny on the back of the horse appearing half submersed below the waterline like a sinking moon, silver smoke roiling from the waterline all around. And that is what San Rixian is drawing. So it's pretty cool. Um, I put that visual image together as I was writing this, and I was like, oh, I get it. The horse is like the waterline, and the smoke is above the water. And then Danny sits on the horse and it's like the moon falling into the sea. And so I was like, dude, you should totally draw the horse against the sea. And there you can see it sort of coming together. Very and nice. I was like, dude, yeah. And how, ta how tall is the grass? Because I feel like the Dothraki seagrass is fairly tall. So you could even have that image of her like where like you can't really see much of the horse. You just see like the horse's head and like Danny sitting above like the green grass of the Dothraki Sea. Oh, Absolutely. yeah. No, sh Should have spoke up sooner. <laughs> Gretchen, that's way cool. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no. I mean, that's I'm, I'm going to make that point in a minute, actually. I mean, that's what that's the picture that George is drawing. And seahorses tend to hang out in seagrass. That's actually their habitat. Seagrass. So, I mean, it's it's really it's a really visual metaphor, but uh, so of course we know that all of the sea dragon and meteors falling into the sea stuff is really just talking about dragon people going into the weirwoods. And that is implied here in the gray as a winter sea horses description as well. When we consider the fact that Drogo compares the silver smoke like mane of the horse to Danny's molten silver hair, we can imagine the horse's mane as molten silver dripping into its gray as a winter sea body. This is simply more Nissa Nissa dissolution language, comparable to Danny losing herself in the Dothraki Sea, or your grit melting into the Winterfell Pond in the Heart Tree, or Danny's hair melting into the bath. It's Nissa Nissa becoming the sea. And yes, I did just call the horse a gray as a winter seahorse. A seahorse. Just the thing to ride around the Dothraki Sea, of course. Mr. Ed, yes, make your Mr. Ed jokes. The Dothraki seeds, um, 
that's going to be trouble as much as I say, of course, and horse in this essay. So just, I don't know, get it out of the way. What can you say? The Dothraki see, um, the Dothraki steeds are automatically a kind of seahorse that run on the waves of the grass sea. And you may recall Danny observing the Dothraki being as fluid as centaurs, which we highlighted previously. Martin is encouraging us to see the connection by describing the silver horse's coat as a winter sea. The fact that seahorses appear to fly through the water on fins that look like wings plays right into the green sea wordplay since what a green seer is, uh, since a green seer is said to fly when he does astral projection through the weirwood trees. One of the preferred habitats for seahorses um, are seagrass beds, as it happens. So putting a seahorse in the Dothraki grass sea works visually as well. And now you'll always picture Danny riding a seahorse around in the tall grasses. Just like you were saying, Gretchen, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good visual metaphor. It's very satisfying. This horse, which is the color of a gray sea, is hereafter always referred to as her silver. So we can even say that it's a silver seahorse. That is, of course, no accident of wordplay either, because as we mentioned, the green grassland that we call the Dothraki Sea used to be a huge inland sea called the Silver Sea. It was ruled by the divine sounding fisher queens who lived in a floating palace, making them floating mermaid goddess figures, much like Daenerys in the Dothraki Sea. These Fisher Queen links only emphasize Danny's mermaid queen and aquatic goddess symbolism. And now that Danny is swimming in this formerly silver sea, she has a silver seahorse. So much synergy. Yes. This essay made me really happy to write. I have to say, it's not like, it's not the most groundbreaking, you know, like I'm not proposing a dramatically radical new idea, I'm more following up on a, on an idea that we've already talked about, but just the, the whole synergy of the symbolism here is just so neat and satisfying. It's uh, it was a lot of fun. Anyways, and of course, thank you, Ravenous Reader, for uncovering the under the sea metaphor. Um, you know, without without which none of this would be possible. This essay would not exist without Ravenous Reader. So it's yet another one that we have to uh, credit to her. Thank you, Ravenous. So we can even say that Danny is riding the horse or that Danny riding the, oh, sorry. We can even say that Danny riding the horse is like floating in a silver sea itself. And not just because its coat looks like a sea, it's because the horse is also called Danny's silver mare. But the Latin word mar, M-A-R, or mare, M-E-R, means sea, such as in the words marine, or mermaid, or Stella Maris, or Maris the most fair. And thus, silver mare could easily be interpreted as silver sea. I mean, Martin says the horse looks like a sea and like silver, but it's fun to find the extra wordplay angle. A silver mar is a silver sea. Martin actually teases us by showing us the silver seahorse running in the actual wet sea, the literal sea, the one made of water. This is from A Storm of Swords before Danny has taken Marine. Suddenly, she could not stand the close confines of the pavilion another moment. I want to feel the wind on my face and smell the sea. Missande, she called, have my silver saddled, your own mount as well. It's 420, everybody. Woo! Pregnant silence, pregnant silence. It is time <laughs> for communion. So Partake Danny... of the body of Garth. Body of Garth, the body of Garth. So she wants to smell the sea, and so she has her silver saddled. I mean, you need a seahorse to ride the waves of the sea, right? Of course. Then a moment later, we read. The tide was coming in, and the surf foamed about the feet of her silver. She could not see her ship standing. Oh, she could see her ship standing out to sea. Valerion floated nearest, the great cog once known as Sedulion. Sedu her sails furled. Further out were the galleys Meraxes and Vagar, formerly Joso's prank and Summer Sun. Uh, so, Tin Jack, our new, newly christened um, uh, Long Night's Watch member, pipes in with a great find. He reminds us that the dark flat spots on the moon are called mares because they used to be thought of as seas, and then we found out they actually really weren't seas. 
Uh, so very cool. Silver mare, Eve, an additional moon reference. Very nice. You're pulling your weight. Tin Jack, good job. Good job. That's 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 what it takes to be a long night's watch patron. You got to come with the with the heavy the heavy artillery like Stephen Stark. Stephen Stark, aka scroll 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 scroll. AKA the Smiling Wolf, Lord Stephen Stark of the Broken Tower, Jedi of Just Ice, he who awaits the Corn King. Always happy to slip in an extra Stephen Stark shout out. A pillar of the community, Stephen Stark. So this last quote that we just read, it's very cool because, hey, look, here's a little Aphrodite sea foam in the water. Very nice. Just to make sure we know this is all about stars falling into the sea and goddesses rising from the sea. And since I talked a bunch, since she read the quote, the line was, the surf foamed around the feet of her silver. So it's literally foaming around the feet of the silver horse. It's very good. Very good stuff. So it's the surf that's, uh, it's, oh yeah. So since it's the surf foaming around the feet of her silver, this may be George, who's a huge comics fan, making a silver surfer joke here. Who knows? As you can see, Danny's silver horse is now actually in the sea a true silver seahorse at last. If you'll look to your left, if you'll look to your left, you'll see the sea dragon boats floating at harbor. <laughs> sea dragon boats are, of course, very similar to the idea of a seahorse because they both symbolize vehicles you can use to ride the waves of the green sea. Uh, let's see here. With all this talk of silver seahorses and sea dragon boats, Surely you are jumping out of your chair to say, ooh, House Valerian, House Valerian. And you're right, clever mythhead. The sigil of House Valerian of Driftmark, a house with the blood of old Valeria in their veins, is indeed a silver seahorse on sea green. The Valerians are dragons who became silver seahorses swimming in the green sea, in other words. Just as Danny the dragon rides her silver seahorse in the green Dothraki Sea, formerly the Silver Sea of the Fisher Queens. As a matter of fact, takes deep breath. Basically 100% of House Valerian symbolism seems designated to demonstrating the idea of green seer dragons. Besides the dragon to silver seahorse thing, we have the fact that the Valerians are basically the heart of the Targaryen royal fleet of sea dragon boats. This is from the World of Ice and Fire. He was a scion of House Valerian a family of old and storied Valyrian heritage who had come to Westeros before the Targaryens, as the histories agree, and who often provided the bulk of the royal fleet. So many Valyrians served as Lord Admiral and Master of Ships that it was, at times, almost considered a hereditary office. By the way, KFA 4303 in the chat says, my Stratocaster is seafoam green. Yes, that's so you can play the Song of the Sea. Of course. Very nice. By the way, seafoam green is an excellent color for a strat. Very nice. Very nice. So the he in this paragraph, the scion of House Valerian, is by far the most famous member of the House of the Seahorse. And that is, of course, the sea snake, Corlys Valerian. The sea snake is named for one of his ships, and a boat named Sea Snake is already a fine sea dragon boat symbol in its own right. Even before you consider that its captain is a blood of the dragon person, with a ton of green seer symbolism. He's a sea dragon sailing a sea dragon, this Corlys Valerian. And of course, his most famous voyages were to the Jade Sea, a match for the sea green of his sigil. And that makes Corlys a green dragon as well as a sea dragon. So he signs very nicely into all the Rhaegal and Jade Sea related stuff from the last couple of Weirwood Compendium episodes, where we saw the green dragon and sea dragon ideas constantly are overlapping and intertwining because of course they are both really sending the same message about green seer dragons man now that i said that thing about how much i say of course it's like just popping out to me like so hard it's a very useful little phrase though that was like when someone pointed out that you say in any case all the time. Now, whenever you say it, I'm like, ah, there, he said it again, he said it again. But I do the same thing with myself. We all have verbal tics that we use. I don't actually think they're a bad thing necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they are useful. Uh, they serve a certain purpose. But yeah, sometimes they really get in your ear and it kills you. But 
You guys like my tour, tour guide voice? I saw somebody typing about being uh, San Rick Santa. I think that was, was that you. Did I crack you up with that one? Yes. <laughs> thankfully, I was muted for once. <laughs> Our turn, turn. So, yeah, exactly. I see the chat. Sea snake, sea serpent. Exactly. You guys get it. Uh, Gregory, uh, Gregory Namath says, is Sam a moon riding the sea when he rides to Old Town and Bravos? Yeah, Sam's a big moon character and his scenes on the boat are great. There's a couple of really great symbolic scenes with Maester Eamon that I will get into at some point. I've taken notes on them, but then they got sort of cut out of an episode. So it'll happen. All right, so in addition to the general nautical prowess and the many Valerians serving as master of ships and Lord Admiral, the ruling Lord of the Valerian family bears the title Lord of the Tides. Of course, the real Lord of the Tides is the moon, which causes and regulates the Earth's ocean tides. And of course, the silver seahorse represents the silver moon. In general, the Valerians seem to be moon characters pretty consistently. I mentioned a moment ago that seahorses cute little buggers that they are, swim upright and appear to fly through the water. A couple of other notes on seahorse anatomy. They have a kind of bony skin armor. The Wikipedia page does call it armor, so I'm not stretching the truth here. And together with the wings and the curling tail, you can see how you might interpret a seahorse as a cross between horses, very tiny bug-eyed fish, and armored sea dragons. Most depictions of the Valerian sigil play up the dragon look of the seahorse, which Makes sense, of course, since they are dragon-blooded seahorses. As it happens, horses and snakes are the two animals that dragons are most compared to, most often compared to, such as in this line from Quentin's Dragon Tamer chapter of A Dance with Dragons. The dragon's head was larger than a horse's, and the neck stretched on and on, uncoiling like some great green serpent as the head rose, until those two glowing bronze eyes were staring down at him. That's far from the only passage like that. Snake dragon comparisons abound, and the dragon's heads are compared to horses on other occasions as well. This passage is the best because it features a green dragon turned serpent with a horse head. So it's basically kind of a remix on the dragonish seahorse idea. Speaking of green dragons, House Valerian and the moon, let's consider Corliss's granddaughter, one of my favorite characters, Bela Targaryen daughter of the rogue prince, Daemon Targaryen, and Lena Valerion, and the rider of the green dragon called Moondancer, though only as a young teenager. You will recall her heroic dragon rider versus dragon rider battle with King Aegon II and Sunfire, which killed Moondancer and injured Bela. That's a sun kills moon scenario, which uh, signifies Bela's Nissanissa moment. Bela eventually goes into the green sea, quote unquote, by marrying back into House Valerion as post moon disaster, or as, I'm sorry, Bela eventually goes into the Green Sea by marrying back into House Valerion as a post moon disaster Nissa Nissa should. In particular, Valeria, uh, in particular, Bela marries Alan Valerion, who would have been at best her third cousin, but probably further removed than that. And it's from Bela and Alan that the current House Valerion descends. Get a drink real quick here. Melanie oh, Lotz, I just popped into this chat. Oh, she's in so. the chat. I'm going to read her dragon name again real quick. Melanie, you promoted yourself to dragon, and I read your dragon name, and it was really awesome. Uh, I did it to music originally, but it was Malaris, the weird dragon, whose scales are white as bone and whose horns, wing bones, and spinal crest are as red as blood. Malaris, who is native to Stigai is the first known Stygian dragon to leave that corpse city at the heart of the shadow in over five millennia. It is rumored that Malaris is inhabited by the spirit of a long vanished sorceress from a shy called Melanie Lot Seven. So thank you, Melanie. You are, I hope you are duly honored. So analyzing this lineage of Bela Targaryen come Valerian or Ne Valerian, or I don't know, I don't know this. Medieval colloquialisms, she, uh, you get it. Analyzing the lineage of Bela in terms of sigil-based symbolism, we can say that her story follows the symbolic story of House Valerion, more or less. Born to the House of the Blood of the Dragon, she rode the Green Dragon and then became a seahorse swimming in the Green Sea. Although Moondancer and Bela 
didn't crash into the water when they had that duel with Moondancer over, uh, sorry, when they had that duel with Sunfire over Dragonstone, like so many other drowning moon maidens and moon dragons, Bela herself was saved by the water in a sense. Because after she crashed and survived, a mean guy named Sir Alfred Broom wanted to execute her, while a brave and true man named Marston Waters stopped him and carried Bela to the maester instead, saving her life. So she was saved by the waters. <laughs> now, we can observe that Dragonstone, where Bela and Moondancer landed, is basically the archetypal template for the idea of a dragon meteor plunging into the sea. It's a smoking dragon rock in the sea, which gives the same visual image as Danny riding her gray as a winter seahorse, with Danny as the dragon rock sitting halfway below the waterline, with smoke coming up out of the sea all around her. Tss. Yeah, it's looking good. Looking good. Can I get like some smoke wisps, maybe? Like in the foreground? Some oh, of yeah. the transparent ones. I have ones. to finish the, the background painting before Brian, yeah, I'm, sorry. Playing, I'm, probably, sorry. I'm, I'm probably getting ahead. I'm sure you've already got a plan. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> looking great, though. Love it. Thank you. I'm trying. That's a great silvery green color that you've got with the horse. It's pretty cool. It's a lot like the the shades that you use for the Grey King sitting on his weirwood throne, which I think is perfect. And intentional, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to incorporate some fire, so that's why we got the red gold tones and stuff in there. So. Yep. Well, it's cool because you've got like the sun is setting. The sun is setting as the moon. So the sun is like darkening as the moon is crashing into the water. And that's that's really cool. I like it oh, a lot. Yeah. That's all OML's idea. I just transcribed it into art from words. <laughs> <laughs> Which is... Which, of course, again, is just the epicness of our partnership. What can I say? <laughs> you know, yeah, I read yeah. George Martin's symbolism and sort of put these visual things together. And then I tell you about them and then you turn them into masterpieces of visual symbolism. Okay. That's I what like it the is. Good stuff. All right. So there's a nice Moons of Ice and Fire clue with Bela and her twin sister, Reyna, that is worth mentioning. We can tell from her moon dancer sunfire fight that Bela should be the fire moon figure, and thus her sister Reyna must be the ice moon. And indeed, Reyna marries into House Hightower, which has white tower and white dragon symbolism, and most famous uh let's see, and the most famous high tower, and the most famous high tower in the story was the Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Gerald Hightower, which brings the heavy other symbolism, the White Sword Knights, into the mix. But even more clear is the symbolism of what Reyna did during the Dance of the Dragons while her sister Bela was getting into the dragon fight with King Aegon and Sunfire. She was safely tucked away in the icy Eyrie. That's right. Reyna played the dragon locked in ice, just like Sansa did, and even brought three dragon eggs to the Eyrie. It's also like Visenya. Rainy stays at Dragonstone, a fire moon symbol, and Reyna goes to the Eyrie, which is an ice moon symbol. And actually... This is very like the pattern that we saw with Rhaenys, the Fire Moon, and Visenya, the Ice Moon, during the conquest. Rhaenys died in Dorne, which is a, a Fire Moon type of place, while Visenya went to the Vale twice. Rhaena's dragons tell the story too. Her first dragon dies immediately after hatching, perhaps indicative of some sort of other-like baby sacrifice symbolism. But she eventually bonds with the very last Targaryen dragon, one of the three eggs that she brought to the Vale. The dragon actually hatches in the icy veil, making it a perfect dragon locked in ice symbol or a dragon locked in ice waking from the ice symbol, I guess you could say. And that dragon even has a perfect dragon locked in ice name, which is, chime in if you know it. What was the name of the last Targaryen dragon, chat? The last dragon. What was the name? Sammy, do you know? No, it was literally just the last dragon. No, it had a name. Gretchen, do you oh. know? I'm learning. I mean, I don't know if it's fair because I have the script in front of me. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Painkiller Jane was the first one in the chat. And the correct answer is morning. Yes. Oh. Morning. It's morning. a perfect dragon locked in ice name. It's the dragon of the morning. And morning because it's the last dragon. M-O-U-R-N. Yes. True. It also plays on the M-O-U-R-N morning. That's nice. I didn't even notice that. 
Nice. So it's evoking the idea of Dawn, the sword of the morning, which we believe to be the original ice of House Stark, or at least I believe that. And even setting aside the Dawn equals ice idea, the waking dragon locked in ice is pretty much equivalent to the sword of the morning figure, the one who brings the Dawn. This is Jon Snow symbolism. Morning, by the way, is a pale pink hatchling with black horns and crest. So one imagines the pale pink of a dawn sky, or perhaps even the pale red flame of the sword dawn burning with magical fire. Hmm, who knows? I like the idea of dawn burning silvery blue or white, but there is symbolism of dawn burning red and pink too. So, And of course, Lightbringer burns red. So that's one of the questions that I am dying to know if dawn is going to come out into play, what color will its fire burn with? Maybe it'll be like a rainbow, a happy rainbow of all the colors. I'm actually not kidding um, because there's a lot of scenes where um, Dawn, Martin describes uh, sunrise or dawn as basically returning all the color to the world, which was previously all gray. And so you get all the shades, like he gives you gold and russets and greens and everything. So I'm not sure. It'll be like the Wizard of Oz. Rainbow fire. Yeah, that'd be, be colorful. Yep. So I just, I just started singing Take Me to Church in my head, by the way. Me I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it every time I see Donna's original ice. My <laughs> brain starts to sing that song. Take me to church. Oh, well, well <laughs> that was, uh, it's up to you whether or not you want to share the YouTube link of you performing that in the chat, Gretchen. I'll leave that to you. But okay. it does exist, guys. It does exist. It's really good. Just, uh, I did. So, <laughs> Yeah, we need to put more of those Mad Libs um, up there. And by the way, quick channel update, guy. Yesterday, uh, guys, guys and gals, yesterday I was hard at work, video editing, uh, learning how to do Adobe Premiere with the help of Sanrixian. Mm -hmm. And I was editing the very first LML and 13 episode, which is going to be about Dawn being the original Ice. And it's going to be a two-parter, be part one and part two. Each one will be 13-ish minutes. Or near enough of those makes no matter. And I'm trying to get that out this week, perhaps even early this week. So get ready for that. I'm going to need y'all's help to share that one. The whole idea of the 13-minute videos is that they uh, are supposed to be more accessible for all the people who don't have time for the long three-hour live streams and the two-hour podcasts. So this is the one you share with all your friends who, uh, you know, most of, the reg most of the rest of the fandom who aren't myth heads. Let's put it that way. So we aren't done with House Valerion, seahorses, Daenerys, or fiery things falling into the sea. Oh, no. However, we are now going to focus on four silver dragons, sort of tie all these things together. And there's simply too much Valerion seahorse goodness to be contained by one section. So we're going to do a section break. Yeah, looking great, Sanry. Yep. And I don't actually have, I just mentioned in the chat, I don't actually have a YouTube video of me singing. I just have like a Google Drive link. I could uh, eventually make a YouTube video, I guess. Uh, it won't be seeing me singing it. But yeah, I just have like audio. I just did an audio recording. I didn't do like a video of it. But I mean, I can share that. I just need to dig it up. Well, it's up to you. It was excellent. And that song uh, is forever changed now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to be able to hear it. Like I, I ruined that song for myself because I, I was singing it so much to try and get it right that like I can't hear it the normal way. Like yeah. I think I was listening to the radio the other day and "Take Me to Church" came on and I started singing my lyrics and was like, "Wait, no, that's not actually the right. That's not actually the right song. <laughs> this isn't actually about a song of ice and fire. This song is actually about something else. It's it, secretly. It's about I don't know. Just secretly, we know. Yes." Yeah, I am. I'm very I'm so honored by it. I'm almost too embarrassed to talk about it. But <laughs> Osher's a big uh, fan, apparently. Big fan of your work. He gets down with the symbolism. Who is? Hoiser. Hoiser. Or who, however you say his name. <laughs> I don't know. The original singer of that song. Yeah, You're the... I, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure that he. Yeah, of course. Uh, let's see. Um, Peg like Pete says with a super chat. I should do a year in review video of all of your great costumes. No, that would just open me up for a ton of criticism of being an egomaniac, which I already get a little bit of that. So let's not go too far with that. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, though. It's flattering. 
I like the idea, but no, I won't do that. You just have to go and watch all the videos. Um, I am always looking for new costumes though, to keep you guys entertained. I hope you do appreciate that. I do have another, I have a different green haired wig that I haven't even worn yet. Uh, so what? get that going soon. What? Break yep. that out. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. It's coming next time I have a, I need to do, um, next time I have an excuse to do my forest background, you'll get that one. It's another Garth variant. So let's honor some Patreon. I'm going to read my other dragons. So my dragons are awesome. And this next section is about dragons. That'll be for Silver Dragons, ma'am. This next section is brought to you by Bronze Stares of the Lily White Scales and Bronze Horns, Wing Bones, and Spinal Crest, a wise old dragon who riddles with sphinxes. And Vase Sperry's the Nightbringer, the Shadowfire Dragon, whose scales are dark as smoke, whose horns, wing bones, and spinal crest are the color of molten silver, and whose eyes are two black moons. Vase Sperry's is on point with the molten silver on topic today. All right. Outer Panda, I don't know who Dean Pelton is. So I don't understand your reference. But Bron Starys did just put out a cool video. He totally did. Would one of my excellent mods please post the link to the Bron Starys video? Um, if you notice, a lot of Bron Starys questions that he likes to send in have to do with trying to puzzle out what exactly happened with Azor Ahai and Nissa Nissa and the War for the Dawn? He's very interested in puzzling out this drama. And so this video that he's just put out is his best attempt at putting together some sort of a cohesive narrative. So it's pretty interesting. It's admittedly speculative, um, but he's, he's you know, taking the plunge and trying to take a stab at it. So it's pretty cool. Have you seen it yet, Gretchen? It's okay if you haven't. I have not yet. Um, yeah, I have not yet. But I do plan on watching it, and I just dropped the link in the chat. Cool. So yeah, I always he, like Bronze Dairies. Yeah, he just put it out like a couple of days ago. So check it out. It's pretty fun. Uh, if you like speculating about uh, all those Dawn Age happenings, then you will dig it. All right. So, Sandry, I'm going to steal the camera back for a second, but I will check back in with you periodically here as you're getting Go to on. the fun part. Yay. <laughs> All right, so I can't help but notice that Danny's silver seahorse, having a coat like a winter sea and a mane like silver smoke, kind of reminds me of the dragon Sea Smoke, a dragon described alternately as gray and white, pale gray, or silver gray. I mean, those are the same descriptions. Gray and silver, sea and smoke. Even better, Sea Smoke is no random dragon. He was ridden by two different Valerions, Lenor Valerion and Adam Valerion. And Adam Valerion was no random Valerion. He was the brother of Alan Valerion, who married Bela, rider of Moondancer. That's right. Danny's silver horse looks like the sea and like smoke, and plays on plays massively on the seahorse symbolism of House Valerion. And then House Valerion has a dragon named Sea Smoke. Danny is a silver dragon riding a silver seahorse, and Adam Valerion is a silver seahorse. Riding a silver dragon. <laughs> Mind blown. That's yeah, fun. I was tickled by that one anyways. And it gets worse, of course, when we consider the sea dragon meteor symbolism. A dragon called Sea Smoke is once again creating the visual depiction of a dragon meteor submersing in the sea and causing smoke. Just like Dragonstone is a smoking rock in the sea, or just like Daenerys when she rides her smoking silver seahorse. Nice. Can you give me the wide shot real quick? Just for effect. Beep. Oh, it's so good. That's the sound it's making That's right the now. Sound. Dope as fuck. Love it. Love it. All right. And yes. When I say sil uh, smoking silver seahorse, you may be thinking of doomed Valeria. And yes, doomed Valeria, now covered by the smoking sea, is getting at much the same idea. 
The doom is obviously a strong parallel to the fire moon destruction, and it's now a sunken land of fire partially covered by a smoking sea. In other words, sea smoke and Danny's horse, they match not only in terms of descriptive language, gray and silver, sea and smoke, but also in terms of symbolic meaning, sea dragon meteors falling into the sea. Although we love talking about meteors and the tsunamis they cause, the more important layer of meaning to the sea dragon and the idea of drowning moon meteors is, say it with me, the idea of dragon people going into the green sea and becoming green seers. We know Martin is using Danny Silver to depict her as riding her seahorse in the green sea. And wouldn't you know it, Adam Valerian and, uh, and wouldn't you know it, the Adam Valerian sea smoke green seer symbolism gets dialed up to 11 during the Dance of the Dragons. That's right, my eyes kind of popped out of my head when I read that Adam Valerian took sea smoke to the friggin' Isle of Faces to consult with the green men during the dance before raising an army from the Riverlands and leading them to Tumbleton to battle off the White and Silverwing, amongst others. Say what? I know, right? Yes, though the Maesters dismiss it as an obviously false tale, it is indeed said that Adam Valerian took sea smoke to the Isle of Faces to chill with the green men before raising an army. The idea of raising an army from the lands watered by the trident, which is the wording there, and from the river lords, as it is written in The Princess and the Queen, it is suggestive of raising an army of green men from the green sea. Obviously, George couldn't have Adam actually storm Tumbleton with actual green men, but by sending him uh, by but by sending him to the green men first and then giving him an army of riverlanders from the trident he's kind of sending the same message we also have to back up and simply appreciate the symbolic ramifications of sending a dragon and a dragon lord to the isle of faces it's creating the well-known stabbing the god's eye symbol since the dragon is basically flying into the pupil of the god's eye which equates to the moon in the celestial version of the god's eye but it's also a symbol of dragons and dragon lords going into the weirwood net. Since nothing represents the weirwood net better than the green Isle of Faces, which is portrayed to us as basically an island full of weirwoods. It's especially notable because it's a Valerian dragon lord who carries the green seer symbolism of their sigil with him. And then when you recall how the dragon sea smoke parallels Danny's silver seahorse, you can see that George has essentially tripled down on the dragons into the green sea symbolism here. And this must be an important idea because George mirrored it pretty much beat for beat with another, another dragon, Silverwing. Uh, and by, sorry, I botched that one back up. This must be an important idea because George mirrored it pretty much beat for beat with another silver dragon, Silverwing. Silverwing is most famous for being the Mount of Good Queen Alisan, but was later ridden by Ulf the White during the Dance of the Dragons. And Ulf the White and Silverwing, they were, Ulf was one of the two betrayers of Tumbleton, and it was he and Hugh the Hammer that Adam Valerian and his army were coming to fight. Ulf the White is an interesting name. Ulf sounds like elf, or perhaps like wolf, which is spelled W-U-L-F in ancient German, I believe. Uh, let's see. He's also known as Ulf the Sot because he's a drunk, but that also implies him as drinking the fire of the gods. And he did, in fact, die by poisoned wine. So we actually get the whole drinking the fire of the gods and dying routine a la Aryan Brightflame. Now, here's where a silver wing echoes sea smoke going to the Isle of Faces. After all the horrendous fighting at Tumbleton, Silverwing went wild and made a lair on an island in the middle of Red Lake which, like Tumbleton, is in the reach. Right away, you can see that, once again, it's a silver dragon going to an island in the middle of a lake. But there's more, because Red Lake also has great skin changer symbolism to parallel the Isle of Faces. If you remember from our Zodiac Children of Garth the Green episode, Rose of Red Lake is one of the named Children of Garth the Green. She was a skin changer, able to transform into a crane at will a power some say some say still manifests from time to time in the women of House Crane, her descendants. Another child of Garth was Brandon of the Bloody Blade, who drove the giants from the Reach and warred against the children of the forest, slaying so many at Blue Lake that it has been known as Red Lake ever since. 
Now, because of the sex, because of the sexual implications of the Bloody Blade symbolism, it seems likely that Brandon of the Bloody Blade was in fact impregnating children of the forest here at Red Lake in the Reach, which is of course how you get human skin changers like those attributed to House Crane, House Stark, and others. Before Brandon waved his bloody blade around, Rose of Red Lake would have been Rose of Blue Lake, which seems an obvious nod to Blue Roses, and thus to maidens of House Stark who die giving birth, which is exactly what happens to female children of the forest impregnated by humans more often than not. So consider also that Rose is of the lake. She's Rose of Red Lake, which implies her as an aquatic humanoid, at least symbolically. But of course, that's just symbolic parlance for being of the green sea. Her lake turns from blue to red due to the shed blood of the children of the forest, which symbolically is her blood. That brings us back to the idea of a child of the forest, Nissa Nissa, bleeding out into the sea, just like Ygritte in John's Winterfell dream or the idea of the Dothraki sea turning to a sea of blood when it flowers. Ergo, the stories we have around Red Lake all have to do with skin changing and humans attaining green seer abilities. So when Silverwing goes and makes her lair there on an island in the middle of a lake, in the middle of the lake, it's, it, it is indeed a wonderful parallel to Sea Smoke, the pale silver dragon going to the Isle of Faces and talking to the green men. Adam Valerion raising an army of symbolic aquatic people from the green sea, the river men from the Trident, might even work as a parallel to the idea of Garth the Green and his son Brandon breeding generations of humans that carry skin changer and green seer genetics from the children of the forest. So I hate to tell you this, guys, but there are two other silver, silver dragons. But there are two other silver dragons that we know of, and they both go to the god's eye as well, albeit in a more violent fashion. One is Quicksilver, the dragon of King Aenys Targaryen, and his young son Aegon after him. Quicksilver and young Aegon were unfortunately pitted against Megor the Cruel, riding the huge Balerion the Black Dread, with Quicksilver being about a quarter of the size of the Black Dread, who was in his prime, more or less. Both Quicksilver and Aegon died at a battle called the Battle Beneath the God's Eye. It's a more violent, I'm sorry, it's more violent, but it's a direct parallel to Adam taking his silver dragon to the God's Eye in the Isle of Faces. Our fourth and final silver dragon is the most famous one of them all, and that would be Meraxes of the Golden Eyes and Silver Scales, as she is called in the World of Ice and Fire. She didn't die over the God's Eye Lake, but the manner of her death is, of course, a smashing replica of the piercing of the God's Eye, as I'm sure you all know by now. Meraxes was shot through her eye with a scorpion bolt at the Hell Holt in Dorne. And of, and of course, both Meraxes and her rider Rhaenys are analogs to the Fire Moon and Nissa Nissa, as you know. But here's a new layer to this familiar story. A Holt, H-O-L-T, Holt, is a small wood or a grove, and thus Hell Holt implies some sort of hell tree. A demon tree, you might say, like the terrible flesh-consuming weirwoods, the trees which look like they are bleeding and burning in symbolic imitation of the bleeding and burning of Nissa Nissa and the moon. Ergo, Meraxes takes the god's eye wound and falls into the hell holt, an infernal grove of trees, symbolically speaking. So both send the familiar message of a dragon going to the god's eye, i.e. going into the weirwood net. There is even an honorable mention. It goes to Grey Ghost, a wild and presumably pale gray dragon that lived on Dragonstone. Grey Ghost was, sadly, torn apart by sunfire. Her corpse left in two pieces near the base of Lilibet. Her corpse left in two pieces near the base of Dragonmont, or the Dragonmont, which is what they call the main mountain on Dragonstone, by the way. And Dragonstone is indeed an island in the sea and a symbol of the fire moon. Not a, oh, let me just back up, man. Getting a little tongue tied here. Grey Ghost was sadly torn apart by sunfire, her corpse left in two pieces near the base of the Dragonmont. And Dragonstone is indeed an island in the sea, and a symbol of the Fire Moon, just like the Isle of Faces. It's not a particularly green island, though, so the parallel isn't very strong to the other silver dragons, but two details bear mention. Danny's silver and gray horse is introduced as spirited and splendid, perhaps implying it as a spirit horse. 
That actually does make sense. Since green seeing is since green seeing is all about astral projection, i.e. flying with your spirit. If we are using the horse as a metaphor for the vehicle that enables such flight, it can be thought of as a spirit horse or a ghost horse. And secondly, there's a pretty cool passage about gray ghost. Gray ghost dwelt in a smoking vent high on the eastern side of the dragon mount, preferred fish, and was most oft glimpsed low over, flying low over the narrow sea, snatching prey from the waters. A pale gray-white beast, the color of morning mist, he was notably shy dragon who avoided men and their works for years at a time. Hey, um, Gretchen, I'm, okay, so I'm going to come back to one of your comments in the chat here in just a second, but real quickly, looking at this, uh, looking at this passage, we see that morning mists are described, I'm sorry, so elsewhere in A Song of Ice and Fire, I should say, morning mists are described as morning ghosts. It happens all over the place. So here, gray ghost is as pale as morning mist. That's pretty cool. Uh, gray ghost likes to fly low over the sea, waiting to dive in to catch fish. And that's, of course, very good sea dragon symbolism. And uh, Questing Beast, my anger manager, points out that uh, Grey Ghost is a shy dragon, like a shy, like Melanie of a shy. And I, uh, we did that whole shy maid symbolism, which ties to Melisandre, the ash shy maid, who has ash in her eye, and on and on and on. Martin basically, <laughs> you know, skull fucked that metaphor uh, as many ways as possible. So. Sorry for the crude language, but he did. He did, and uh, Grey Ghost is a shy maid, so very cool. But just a second ago, Bail the Bard, you said that you see some green zombie stuff in Adam's raising of symbolic green sea men to fight for the blacks, which is the side of the usurped queen Rhaenyra. And I would agree, especially when you consider they're going to fight against um, the, the betrayers, and the betrayers, their heroic dragon, one of them is Tessarion, the Blue Queen, who would represent the others. And so mm -hmm. that kind of makes sense. Yep. Yep. And it's interesting that Ulf the White uh, rides Queen Alisane's dragon. And uh, I think there are a lot of ties between like dragons and thrones as both seats. Um, so like someone who takes another person's dragon, though not technically usurpation, like could be potentially like veer into that kind of language where you have like good queen alisane and then her and then ulf the white riding her dragon and likely fighting on the opposite side that good queen alisane likely would have been for because she was all in favor of uh rainy's inheriting the throne and so she absolutely would have been on rainier's side um for the blacks but ulf the white fights uh betrays and fights for the greens yep and that makes sense um you know, Ulf the White is, you know, got that white dragon symbolism that sounds pretty otherish, pretty wintry. Um, we, I need to go back and break down his stuff a little more thoroughly. But yes, I see Aziz El Duri uh, showed up in the chat just in time for the green semen wordplay. Welcome, Aziz. I hyped, uh, by the way, Aziz, I hyped our uh, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn panel for next week. So that's going, it's going down. So here I'd like to add a word about George's gardener writing style and how that interacts with symbolism. Obviously, George wrote the Daenerys scenes in the Dothraki Sea, which are in a Game of Thrones, um, that have her silver seahorse and all that stuff long before he wrote about sea smoke, silver wing, quicksilver, and Meraxes' death in Dorne. Moondancer and the rest of the Dance of the Dragons, too, for that matter. He did conceive of House Valerion, and their basic symbolism by the beginning of A Clash of Kings. But essentially what seems to have happened here is that George was inventing dragons to fill out the battles of the Dance of the Dragons history. And when he did that, he took the advantage or took the opportunity to build on the silver seahorse symbolism that he had already created with Danny and House Valerion by giving Leonor and Adam Valerion a dragon called Sea Smoke, whose name and symbolism correlate to Danny's silver seahorse and basically build on it. He did the same thing with all these silver dragons going to the god's eye in various ways. And the same goes for Moondancer and her legendary fight with Sunfire and all of Bela's life story. So essentially, this is all a clever way of building upon the lines of symbolism that he laid out initially 
as he fleshes out the corners of his world. All of which is to say, it's not, not an accident. It's not an accident that Danny is riding a silver seahorse around the green Dothraki Sea. It's a clever way to build on the obvious seahorse metaphor implied by the horse lords ruling a grassland sea, but then bring in a whole metric assload of other green seer dragon symbolism. And I wanted to take the time to point this out, guys, because, you know, you're you're listening to this and I'm reading to you a quote from early on in A Game of Thrones. And I'm like, look, his beard is just like the Grey King's beard. But we don't really hear about the Grey King until I think it's a feast for crows um, and it's expanded on in the world of ice and fire. So it might seem sort of counterintuitive, like, why are you comparing stuff that's written 20 years later as if George, you know, planned that out? And I think he plans out like the basics of it, like this idea of a gray winter sea was an important symbol to him. Uh, and then later when he created the Grey King, he gave the Grey King's beard the gray as a winter sea moniker. So a lot of times the order flows opposite from the way that I'm actually introducing the symbolism. But that is why I feel free to sort of jump from book five to book one to the world of ice and fire to Duncan Egg and just compare these symbolic motifs because what he's often doing is he's conceiving the basic part in a Game of Thrones and then just expanding on it as he continues to write more dragon battles. You know, as you can see, as the books go on, he continues to find new ways to show the moon and sun disaster. So, you know, just a word about writing and stuff. So another section break here, Gretchen, comments? I need a break. My throat hurts. Hopefully you have something to say. Um, I probably do. Too. Um, oh yeah, let's let's check in. Let's see what Sanry's doing. What are you working on right now, Sanry? Well, I just painted on a boob, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm finishing up um trying to get rid of uh some of my building lines that you can kind of see like underneath. So nice. those boobs don't paint themselves now, do they? They don't no, they don't. They I'm don't have to do it. Oh, oh, one painful. thing that did come up while I was reading uh the essay before we recorded was um at one point, Rhaenyra Targaryen, um, her, she makes her coat of arms. It's got four quarters and it's got Targ in like the Targ dragon in the top left and bottom right. The top right is House Aaron for her mother, Emma Aaron. And then the bottom left is House Valarion because her first husband um, was Leonor Valarion. So you have like the Targ like red dragon on a black field. So you have like the flaming moon meteor in like a dark sky with like the blue falcon set against a white moon, like the bird flying against the moon, as well as like a green, like the silver seahorse on a green sea. And I was just like, thanks George for like putting all of the like layered symbolism all on like a single sigil all together. You've got all the green seer stuff like all these various like versions of the same thing or the same events, just like all on one sigil that belongs to Rhaenyra Targaryen in the Dance of the Dragons. And it just made me very happy. The only one I'm <clears throat> not completely clear about is um, how she interacts with the RN symbolism um, because she doesn't have a lot of icy symbolism that I've been able to spot. Uh, yeah, it just depends on how you connect. Um, the ice queen and the, well, like I was thinking like the, the, the Falcon, like the flying, um, the idea of flying in green seers as being like astral projection and flying, um, was part of what I was thinking of, uh, um, yes, like the winged true. knights, because mm -hmm. you know, the winged knights are from the Vale of Aaron. Um, and that's, I mean, basically a dragon, you have an armored being, the, you know, an armored rider flying is like a dragon. Um, so that was that was where my mind went to was then was more of the like flying and green seeing and astral projection imagery of it rather than necessarily like the ice moon. And that's definitely implied with the whole moon door thing. I mean, it's the whole point of having a weirwood throne and making people fly out of a weirwood moon door. Yeah. So flying the through whole, the moon. And when when we do soon, we are soon going to get back to signs and portals. And I'm going to show you how fire flips to ice inside the weirwood net. Or at least mm -hmm. I'm going to show you examples of George showing us that happening. Um, and so that's what I would see with the whole, like, with Rhaenyra's sigils. There's, she's showing that flip. Yep. Uh, let's see. So hmm. she's got it all, all right there. Nice. Alrighty. 
Nice. I see some starry ha things happening. Sanrixian. Oh, yeah. Some, some bubbles and some Ooh. smokes. We'll get there. All right, let me queue up the music. Let's go ahead and read those other three members of the Long Night's Watch. That sounds good. Wooden Wings. This next section is brought to you by the Long Night's Watch. By Sharon Isais, Dread Ferryman of the North, Wielder of the Staff of the Gods, A Weirwood Staff Banded in Valerian Steel. By Asyncia, Frozen Fire Queen of the Summer Snows and Burner of Winter's Wake. And by Blue Raven of the Lightning Pack, The Frozen Thunderbolt, whose words are, The way must be tried. I got a surprising amount of comments on the backwards flamenco. People are totally digging it. All right. So horses that ride in the Dothraki Sea are like seahorses. I think we got that by now. But there's uh, but that's actually only one side of the seahorse metaphor because there are but that's actually only one side of the seahorse metaphor because there are a not insignificant number of ships that sail on actual water who are thought of as horses, a seahorse of another color. It was prophesied that the stallion will ride to the ends of the earth, she said. The earth ends at the black salt sea, Drogo answered at once. He wet a cloth in a basin of warm water to wipe the sweat and oil from his skin. No horse can cross the poison water. In the free cities, there are ships by the thousand, Danny told him, as she had told him before. Wooden horses with a hundred legs that fly across the sea on wings full of wind. The seahorse material that we just hashed out in detail is really all about green seeing. And I briefly mentioned that the seahorse works very similar to the sea dragon boat idea, both of them being vehicles that you can use to ride or sail the green sea which means astral projection through the use of the weirwood tree. Well, wooden seahorse boats basically merge these two ideas, since, uh, especially since it's the dragon princess who wants to sail these seahorse boats. They would then be sea dragon ships and wooden seahorses. The astral projection aspect of green seeing is spelled out by the fact that these wooden seahorses have wings full of wind on which they can fly. Danny also mentioned something about the stallion who mounts the world riding to the ends of the earth. That sounds either like astral projection or maybe even a prophecy of doom. The stallion rides to the ends of the earth could be read like Nero fiddles to the ends of Rome. Or even just as the stallion riding to an event, which is the end of the earth. We'll come back to the stallion who mounts in the future. Let's stick with the winged wooden seahorses and see where that gets us. So seahorse boats with wings full of wind, actually bring us back to Danny's silver seahorse, which, as it turns out, has windy wings too. As Drogo gives a, as after Drogo gives her the silver seahorse, she goes for a ride, and as she picks up speed, she finds herself headed straight for a campfire. The silver horse leapt the flames as if she had wings. When she pulled up before Magister Illyrio, she said, "Tell Cal Drogo that he has given me the wind." The fat Pentoshi stroked his yellow beard as he repeated her words in Dothraki, and Danny saw her new husband smile for the first time. The last sliver of sun vanished behind the high walls of Pentos to the west just then. Danny had lost all track of time. Ah, so it's a windy, winged horse, perfect for flying like a green seer flies. And of course, the wind is what the green seers use to speak through the trees. You'll even remember Veramir Sixkins after he was killed or died, failing to take over Thistle's body, he passed through to his one-eyed wolf as a spirit on the wind. The silver horse is like the wind, and that reminds us of the swift as the wind he rides language of the stallion who mounts prophecy. Notice that Danny loses all track of time 
while riding the gray horse. And that's most likely a reference to the timelessness of the Green Seer existence. She's riding her winged silver gray seahorse in the Green Sea and losing track of time. I think you can see what's going on here. I hope you know that House Valerian is also going to get in on this, get in the mix on this other side of the seahorse metaphor coin. Oh yes, they do love boats after all. There's a great clue about their seahorse being linked to flying ships during the burning of the seven slash forging of fake Lightbringer scene on Dragonstone. Davos sees his sons mingling with the nobility, including the heirs of House Valerion, and he thinks, in time, my little black ship will fly as high as Valerion's seahorse, which gives us both flying ships and the flying silver seahorse in one line. And at the risk of stating the obvious, this is happening when the wooden sea dragon boats turned statues of the gods of the seven are burned and Lightbringer is forged. Flying boats, flying seahorses, and burning sea dragon boats, all in one, all gathered around the Lightbringer ritual. On Dragonstone, a smoking rock in the sea. Not too long after the burning of the seven, it's finally time for Stannis to attack King's Landing, to take what is his by rights. LOL, don't take yourself so seriously, bro. Naturally. The, yeah, I had to get in a little Stannis. So sorry. Dig, yeah, so sorry. Uh, naturally, the Valerians are a major part of the fleet, and we see an excellent juxtaposition of sea dragon and seahorse symbolism when they approach the city. The war horn sounded again, commands drifting back from the fury. Davos felt a tingle in his missing fingertips. Out, oars, he shouted. Form line. A hundred blades dipped down into the water as the oarsman's master's drum began to boom. The sound was like the beating of a great, slow heart, and the oars moved at every stroke, a hundred men pulling as one. Wooden wings had sprouted from the wraith and Lady Maria as well. The three galleys kept pace, their blades churning the water. Slow cruise, Davos called. Lord Valarion's silver hold, Pride of Driftmark, had moved into her position to Port of Wraith, and bold laughter was coming up fast, but Harriden was only now getting her oars into the water, and Seahorse was still struggling to bring down her mast. All right, so the drums are beating in unison like a great heartbeat, and we've discussed this previously as a symbol of the hive mind of the heart trees issuing forth from a fleet of Stannis' wooden sea dragon ships here, ones which burn with green fire to make the green seer symbolism even thicker. Revisiting this passage again, we can see that the wooden wings of the sea dragon boats sprout when the hive mind heartbeat is achieved. This is heavy duty astral projection symbolism and wooden wings are about as obvious a reference to the idea of using trees to fly as you could possibly imagine. As promised, you can see that right alongside all this great sea dragon ship stuff, we also find seahorses, Lord Valerian's silver ship, and another ship called Seahorse, which is presumably also owned by the Valerians. I mean, if you show up to the Battle of the Blackwater and you're not from House Valerian and you name your ship Seahorse, you're going to get kind of a eat shit and die look from Lord Valerian, aren't you? Right? I mean, <laughs> party foul. Hello. Anyways. <laughs> don't you don't want to wake the seahorse dragon, do you? <laughs> what is the meaning of this? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So okay, you made him sound really jowly. Yeah, well, he's a seahorse. <laughs> he's his old Lord Monfred Valerian. He sounds Mo Monfred, does that mean Moonford, by the way? Fording the mares of the moon, Moonford Valerian? Perhaps. Anyways. All of these sea dragon boats and winged wooden seahorses are flying straight for the fire of the gods. And they get it in the form of a 50 foot tall jade demon with a dozen hands in each a whip and whatever they touch burst into fire. One of the ships touched by the jade demon is Lord Valerion's ship. Oops, I got distracted by the chat, my bad. Okay. <clears throat> Lord Valarion's shining pride of Driftmark was trying to turn, but the demon ran a lazy green finger across her silvery oars, and they flared up like so many tapers. For an instant, 
She seemed to be stroking the river with two banks of long, bright torches. <laughs> we really do need to get you one of those like arm extender uh, grabber things to like flip oh, it on and off. Oh, that's what you meant. Like literally, I was thinking like some electronic remote. You're talking about literally like a grabber. So like, yeah, like oh, literally a grabber. grabber. You got if you guys missed this, I was telling LML before we started that he needed one of those grabbers that they make for for the elderly to grab things off high shelves that he could use and just like flip the light switch on and off. That'd be really tricky. It would just be me going like motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone would get a kick out of it. I'm sure it would be would. really funny. Less effective though. Okay. All right. So now those wooden wings are burning. Shades of Icarus, perhaps. And either way, it's a merging of the burning sea dragon boat idea and the winged wooden seahorse idea. The green fire of the gods has been obtained, but I'm not sure how proud Lord Valerion is feeling right at that moment. The name Prime of Driftmark actually creates another parallel to Danny's damnable silver horse that I just won't stop talking about. Hesitantly, she reached out and stroked the, stroked the horse's neck, ran her fingers through the silver of her mane, Khal Drogo said something in Dothraki, and Magister Illyrio translated. Silver for the silver of your hair, the call says. She's beautiful, Danny murmured. She is the pride of the Kalisar, Illyrio said. Custom decrees that the Khaleesi must ride a mount worthy of her place by the side of the call. Nice. Well read. Thank you. Some good voices there. I like your Danny voice. That's good. The pride of the horse lords is a silver seahorse. The pride of Driftmark is a silver ship belonging to the seahorse lord. And come on, you know that ship has a seahorse of some kind on its prow, right? Anyway, let's hope Danny's silver does not catch on fire like Lord Valerion's silver ship. Or like this horse from A Dance with Dragons, who unfortunately does not have wings. In a dozen heartbeats, they were past the Dothraki as he galloped far below. To the right and left, Danny glimpsed places where the grass was burned and ashen. Drogon had come this way before, she realized. Like a chain of gray islands, the marks of his hunting dotted the green grass sea. A vast herd of horses appeared below them. There were riders, too, a score or more, but they turned and fled at the first sight of the dragon. The horses broke and ran when the shadow fell upon them, racing through the grass until their sides were white with foam, tearing the ground with their hooves, but as swift as they were, they could not fly. Soon one horse began to lag behind the others. The dragon descended upon him, roaring, and all at once the poor beast was aflame, yet somehow he kept on running, screaming with every step until Drogon landed on him and broke his back. Danny clutched the dragon's neck with all her strength to keep from sliding off. And let's look at Sanry's drawing from it. Here it is. Got some uh, smoke in there now. Ooh. Okay. Let me let me focus on you. Oh wow. Yeah, I love what you've done with layering like the waves over the horse's body on the bottom half. That's really really cool. I'm trying to make it make sense, kind of, but it's it's hard to make trippy mythical art make sense. <laughs> Sometimes it's true. It's true. Oh, the dragon is smoking. We have we have a smoking green sea and a, <laughs> we have a, smoking, and a smoking green dragon. green dragon. I was waiting for somebody to put it together. <laughs> I'm just trying to make metaphors here, man. Uh huh. Right. <laughs> right. You got you got to say that in a bit more hippie-ish way when you say that, too. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just trying to make metaphors here, man. I just what? Let me make my metaphors, dude. Yeah, dude. <clears throat> I'm a smoking sea dragon. There smoking you are a smoking sea dragon <laughs> <laughs> oh we have a uh, another super chat from gregory namath says safety meeting I don't i'm glad somebody else calls them safety meetings when i used to work at guitar center that's what we used to call them <laughs> really that's hilarious i've never heard that then eventually it became going to walgreens because there's a walgreens like a block away and okay mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Walgreens, get it? Walgreens. We actually did go to Walgreens, but it was an enjoyable pun. So, mm -hmm. so this uh, this poor horse can't fly, and flying horses. I mean, <laughs> that would be silly. 
Who would, you know, who would think of a thing like that? Of course, Danny's silver horse did seem like it had wings when she first wrote it. And if we read that quote again, we actually find hope that Danny's horse will not burn like the Valerian's seahorse ship. The line was, her silver horse leapt the flames as if she had wings. See? Good news. She flies right over the fire. Good news, right? All mm -hmm. the foreshadowing in A Song of Ice and Fire is like, horribly bad. Ghost is going to die, you know? Like, the seahorse is not going to die. I feel good bringing you guys some good news. I'm so glad the seahorse is okay. Yeah, yes. I know, right? That would be too much. I would, th I'd throw my book. I'd flip the coffee table. Well, that was just like um, when did you watch Neverending Story? Yes. When, when Artax dies, Artax. It's just like, the horse dies. It was sad. So, so I'm glad the horse won't die. Hopefully. Way to way to bring everything down. Gee whiz. I'm saying it's not that. Oh. So it's the opposite of that, which is okay. good. All right. Because that was traumatizing. Yes, well. I think I'm the only one who actually liked the nothing in that. And I think that says a lot about me. <laughs> As a child, I was like, oh, look at this wolf. I this want wolf to thing. become the void. I'd like to be <laughs> the void, please. That's oh, Henry. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. All the painful childhood memories are coming out. So Danny's Danny's last A Dance with Dragons chapter, from which that last quote came, also has a nice passage where Danny compares riding Drogon to riding her silver. The dragon lords of old Valyria had controlled their mounts with binding spells and sorcerous horns. Daenerys may do with a word and a whip. Mounted on the dragon's back, she oft felt as if she were learning to ride all over again. When she whipped her silver mare on her right flank, the mare went left. For a horse's first instinct is to flee from danger. When she laid the whip across Drogon's right side, he veered right. For a dragon's first instinct is always to attack. If we're comparing Danny's mounts to one another, as she is in this scene, then we can look at the silver mare as a symbol of the moon, pre-destruction, an untainted silver sea, looking glass flat, a nice happy silver moon, or a nice happy silver horse. Drogon would be the moon post-destruction, a fire-breathing dragon, symbolic of the black, fiery meteors that the moon became. Recall that Danny's silver hair burns off when she mounts Drogon in Dasnak's pit, just as it did in Drogo's pyre when she woke the dragons. This symbolizes the shift from silver untainted moon to burnt or reforged or reborn moon. So speaking of Drogo's Pyre, that's actually where we're going to finish this essay with our last flying silver or gray horse. This one really does fly up to the stars. The flames were so beautiful. The loveliest things she had ever seen. Each one a sorcerer robed in yellow and orange and scarlet, swirling long smoky cloaks. She saw a horse. A great gray stallion limbed in smoke, its flowing mane a nimbus of blue flame. Yes, my love, my sun and stars, yes, mount now, ride now. Her vest had begun to smolder, so Danny shrugged it off and let it fall to the ground. Now, she thought, now. And for an instant, she glimpsed Khal Drogo before her, mounted on his smoky stallion, a flaming lash in his hand. He smiled, and the whip snaked down at the pyre, hissing. This really is similar to Danny's horse, which looks like a gray sea and like silver smoke. Drogo's mount is a great gray stallion limbed in smoke with a mane of blue flame. It's being summoned here as the moon maiden is burned, as the dragons are woken, and as the fiery sorcerers dance and swirl their smoky cloaks. The column of rising smoke and ash is a weirwood tree symbol via the ash tree dual metaphor, which we covered in detail in Weirwood Compendium 4 in a grove of ash. And we also know that there are other weirwood symbols here at the alchemical wedding, like the burning logs with secret hearts, the thunderous green dragon egg awakening, and one or two others. It's here that Danny's Nissa Nissa sacrifice opens up the way for Azor High to ride the gray slash silver horse, almost as if Danny had given her silver horse to Drogo. Now he can ride it up to the Sea of Stars. 
In Danny's Wake the Dragon Dream, which foreshadows this dragon hatching bonfire, there's an allusion to the silver horse being an astral projection mount that can gallop through the stars. Her silver was trotting through the grass to a darkling stream beneath a sea of stars. As above, so below, because the grass below is a sea, just as the stars above are a sea. Honestly, I mostly included that last quote because the sea of stars line is so cool. But the far stronger clue about riding the silver or gray horse into the stars comes at the beginning of the alchemical wedding chapter. When <clears throat> at the beginning of the alchemical wedding chapter, when Danny's inner monologue explains the Dothraki beliefs about such things. When a horse lord dies, his horse is slain with him, so he might ride proud into the nightlands. The bodies are burned beneath the open sky, and the call rises on his fiery steed to take his place among the stars. The more fiercely the man burned in life, the brighter his star will shine in the darkness. Jogo spied it first. There, he said in a hushed voice. Danny looked and saw it, low in the east. The first star was a comet, burning red, blood red, fire red, the dragon's tail. She could not have asked for a stronger sign. According to Dothraki beliefs, Drogo is riding the stallion of smoke and flame up to the stars, where the red comet will apparently be his star, his final mount in the starry calisar, as Danny refers to it later in A Dance with the Dragons. This creates a wonderful parallel between Danny and Drogo as it pertains to their mounts. Danny traded the silver horse for the black dragon, and Drogo's spirit is riding the gray smoky horse up to the stars where she trade where he trades it in for the red dragon comet. Similarly, when Danny rides her dragon, she thinks about reaching the comet. She tried to imagine what it would feel like to straddle a dragon's neck and soar high into the air. It would be like standing on a mountaintop, only better. The whole world would be spread out below. If I flew high enough, I could even see the seven kingdoms and reach up and touch the comet. Not only is she flying up to the comet like Drogo, this passage really sounds more like Bran's coma dream, flying over the world than anything else. A similar line comes when she recalls her flight on Drogon from Daznak's pit, where she saw a silver moon almost close enough to touch. And again, the flying and looking down at the world language is similar to Bran's coma dream flight. Bran's dream was a small taste of green seer astral projection, essentially. And that's what's implied with all of this flying up to the stars and the moon and the comet business. It's astral projection. All of this is enabled by the smoky stallion or the silver seahorse or some other such weirwood symbol. It's astral projection through use of the weirwoods. Here I will mention two other occurrences of silver smoke that pertain to these ideas. One is Bran's wolf Summer, whose fur is silver and smoke. And Bran does indeed hone his skin changer abilities in summer before switching to the weirwood tree as a mount. The other silver smoke that we saw was in the last weirwood compendium essay. It was that fiery ladder that the fire mage climbed towards the latticed roof of the market, which disappeared and left no more than a wisp of silver smoke. That ladder was also a symbol of climbing to the stars and thus astral projection. <clears throat> Those of you screaming for me to talk about Sleipnir can finally stop screaming. Please stop. It hurts. Don't scream. Take a deep breath. Relax. We're going to talk about Sleipnir because Odin's eight-legged horse Sleipnir. Sleipnir. Sorry, Sleipnir. Now you're screaming again. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Odin's eight-legged horse Sleipnir is a great gray stallion, the best of horses. And he's basically a vehicle for astral projection and riding through the cosmos. Martin surely got the notion of gray and silver horses as symbols for astral projection and the weirwoods from Sleipnir, who looms very large in Norse myth, which George has studied extensively. We're already familiar with Odin's other astral projection horse, the gallows tree Yggdrasil, or the gallows horse, which is also a tree, Yggdrasil. And that is a horse in the sense that the men who ride the gallows tree, um, I'm sorry, backing up just a second. 
We're already familiar with Odin's other astral projection horse, the gallows horse Yggdrasil, which is a horse in the sense that men are said to ride the gallows tree, and Odin is thought of as riding Yggdrasil throughout the cosmos. Essentially, the same shamanic idea is approached through two different but similar metaphors using horses. One horse really is a tree, and Martin is using that as his primary influence for the weirwoods, and by making use of the gray and silver horse and seahorse symbols to navigate the various green seas, he's basically tying Sleipnir into the weirwood net family of ideas too. Unfortunately, Sleipnir and the astral projection horse are topics too big to unleash at this point in an essay. So this is where we'll pick up next time in Weirwood Compendium 9, The Stallion Who Mounts the World. We'll start with a better explanation of Sleipnir and the shamanic practices behind the idea of an astral projection horse, and then we'll tear into The Stallion Who Mounts the World prophecy, which is one of the very coolest symbolic <laughs> metaphors that George has come up with in the entire series. There you go. Bum bum. Dramatic flourish. <sighs> oh my gosh. Dun dun dun. That's quite the cliffhanger to hang on. To end yep. on. Well, we'd be going another three hours if I kept going. So Yeah, I know. I think it's great. Yeah, I saw some people in the chat thinking, oh, Stallion Who Mounts the World. That must be about seahorses and green seeing and all that stuff. And you're damn right it is. It's totally about that. And the Stallion Who Mounts in the World, uh, Stallion Who Mounts the World stuff is also going to tie back into all the Rego ideas because mm -hmm. Rego is the one prophesied to be the Stallion Who Mounts the World. And we already saw that Rego is tied into a bunch of Green Seer stuff because of Regal, the Green Dragon. So it's going to be a nice tying together of the Green Dragon and the Stallion and Green Seeing. And nice. Uh, it's going to take some going to take some wrapping your brain around so it'll be a whole essay on its own i do have little bits of it written so i'm not gonna be too long before i get that one out but yeah there it is so thanks everybody i see some nice emojis in the chat thanks everyone i do actually have a little more there's a bonus section ah, bonus. to this essay that's right bonus section there's more valerian shit and uh, I didn't fit in the regular essay. I did have it in the regular essay, but it was like too much of a side deviation from Daenerys. So I chopped it out and moved it to the end. But some of you might be thinking of the fact that the Valerians have a wooden throne, the throne, a driftwood throne, which is obviously green seer stuff. So I've got a little, little bonus section, but uh, I need to use a bathroom and grab a drink. So. Gretchen and Senrixian, if you could carry things, interact with the chat for just a couple of minutes. I'll be right back. Yeah, so um, KFA4303 mentioned earlier talking about the pale mare, um, that it could also be seen as the pale sea, like when the ghost grass takes over, which oh, yeah. I think is really cool. Sorry to butt right back in as soon as I said I was leaving, but yeah, I know <laughs> I did, uh, she rolls her eyes. So yeah, I, I flagged this one for discussion. So thanks for carrying on. This was a good, this was a good comment. So yeah, cheers, go for it. Yeah, um, which is like a really, really cool point, especially because like the idea of the ghost grass taking over is connected with like the others and made me think of, and then you'd have like a ghostly sea. So like really like a, like a ghost sea or a smoking sea. And that makes me think of like a frozen sea or like an icy sea, like a sea that's turned white because it's frozen. Um, I like that. Yeah. What do you think about that, Tanri? I think that's a really good um, train of thought. Um, what was it exactly? The pale mare. Yeah. And then also um, pale mare is death. Like mm -hmm. the four horsemen. So like, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean anything? Does it, is it just a coincidence? But I don't think so. I definitely think there's some heavy... Um, death required for this green seer magic right because and even in the even in the books the pale mare is the other name for the bloody bloody flux which is dysentery which um yeah. you know so you have like death and not just any kind of death like blood death yeah. like a death that brings a lot of blood so that i mean the idea of like blood magic being involved and i think it brings in all of that yeah it's it's really nice good catch there yes good job KFA 4303. 
Um, yeah, let's see what else do we have. Oh, yeah, Hunter. So the Wolfswood says pale mare, pale grass, pale child. Oh, yeah, the pale nice. child of Bacalon. Um, got some interesting stuff there. And of course, whenever I think of like something being pale, it makes me think of the weirwoods and yeah, all of that stuff ties again. Um, uh, ooh, trapped green seers riding the weirwood tree goddess. Just saying. Uh, yeah, I'm with That's you nice. on that, Midge Cam. Trapped green seers riding the weirwood tree goddess. Yeah, because there's everything about the weirwood throne being like you have like a white throne that the green seers are riding. Right. Um, and that was why that comment I made earlier about how I think like dragons and thrones tie together because yeah, you know that's a good that was a really good point um you mount them both yeah and like the dragons being mounted by people who uh like I'm thinking of Magor like mounting Valerion and taking his father's dragon and just kind of like turning it into corruption mm -hmm. it's interesting yeah, I haven't really followed that line, but it would be interesting to see what happens if there's anything unique when dragons have multiple riders. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where um, I I want I I don't understand it almost. Like I'm like I feel like it should be one dragon per person, and LML is going to come back and be like, "Damn it, Sanry, how did you get on dragons again?" <laughs> but always. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Um, but yeah. Uh, I like the idea of the dragons uh, having a single rider because it makes the bond more unique. But at the same time, having those multiple riders has to say something about the dragons themselves. So I hope we get more answers for that. But I right. doubt we will. But I really right. like the idea of the green dragons and everything we've been talking about so far. Yeah, because it doesn't seem like it seems like not every dragon gets multiple riders. Like it's yeah. a thing that it's it's not a given that a dragon will ever have multiple riders. Um, but they may have one. They may have more than one. Appears in a cloud of smoke. <gasps> Here's the dragon. Speaking of the dragon. <laughs> Stop that face. <laughs> Stuck there for a second. <clears throat> I got, I got frozen like some ghost grass. No, I love that. Um, this is a really exciting find by KFA because the ghost grass spreads across the world like the mm -hmm. others. I've made that comparison and they've got stalks like milk glass. So they basically look like a field of milk glass swords. They are animated with the spirits of the damned. Uh, so it's a really strong others parallel. They kill all the other grass. So that is exactly like the pale mare. I love that because I've been trying to figure out what the pale mare was about symbolism wise, and I couldn't do it. Uh, but the, the pale mare, it's like the sickening of the sea, isn't it? It's like yeah. a, it's a poisoning of the sea and, and a freezing of the sea, which mm -hmm. is, gets right back into our whole like partition in the weirwood net thing. And the others have part of the, the green sea that they're freezing and making that frozen lake, you know, or, or maybe the partition was created to freeze the others in the lake, like Lucifer trapped in the lake, you know, in Dante. Mm -hmm. So very cool. I'll have to think about that one. Right. Yeah. Especially because I don't know if you heard it while you were, I mean, I don't know what your house layout is like, if you could hear us talking. Um, uh, was the idea of like the bloody like the pale mare is the bloody flux so you have in there this idea of like blood um and like a very bloody death and like blood being a part of this whole like pale mare idea which you get with like the weirwoods with blood and bone and the bleeding moon goddess and um so i think i definitely think there's something there to be explored so that yeah that was a really really good catch the pale mare now i'm gonna now whenever i see mare i'm gonna think be thinking c which is probably what we're supposed to be doing. So yeah. one of the things that we noticed in the um, fire and blood panel is that there's a lot of cold diseases. There's like the winter fever and the shivers. Um, mm -hmm. And both of those remind you of grayscale. Um, mm -hmm. So I think all these plagues are actually cold if we look at it, except for the, the fireworm area thing. I guess I shouldn't say all of them, but a lot of these plagues are cold seems like they're symbolic stand-ins for being whited or or the other sort of taking over the freezing of the sea the poisoning of the sea so that's cool that'll be something we'll get into in signs and portals probably uh but nice one nice kfa you uh if you're not a, if you didn't already consider yourself a myth head you are definitely a myth head that's a good one <laughs> so let's see here sanry checking back in with you again 
Looks like you're making the starry sea a little bit. Stars yep. and bubbles. I like it. I think this is about as far as I'm going to take this one. I don't want to work it to death. Yeah. Fix her hair up a little bit now that I just noticed how dark that was. But yeah. I could I could do with like a very silly seahorse animation of some kind. All right. <laughs> or something. I don't know. Is Rusty <clears throat> here? Uh, I haven't seen Rusted. Well, he might be a lurker. Not too, animation for him. him. Yeah, I haven't seen him either. Okay, no, 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 Sandra, you need to do like a Danny version of the like SpongeBob photo of like SpongeBob riding the seahorse with like the red hair yeah, streaming behind. You should do that. Melanie will love it because Melanie loves that. Melanie Lot Seven loves that. Uh, loves that gift for that image. Oh, Sponge SpongeBob rides a seahorse. Yeah, there's like an image of like SpongeBob riding a seahorse with like red flaming hair. It's supposed to look like the little mermaid. She's used like yeah. She likes to use it for um I don't even remember, but when we talk about seahorses, she'll often use that one. It's a pretty funny gift. This one. See? See? Oh, it's even a green seahorse. I love yes. it. It's green red seahorse. hair. And craters in the cheese, like the moon craters. Wow, yes. that's actually like really good. I know, right? So I was like, you should make like an actual, like official, like myth head version. Oh, guys. <laughs> oh, man. Do it. Do well, I mean, she already, it. the one she just did is kind of already like Danny riding her horse is, but yeah, I want like a stupid looking seahorse. All right. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. It's so let it be done. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. Yes. So let it be written. So let it be done. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and hit y'all with. This little bonus section, it's just, it's real short. Um, so just a little bonus here, but. So guys, I hope your brain hasn't melted like Danny's hair because as, as ever, it gets worse the deeper you go. I have a couple more really great tidbits on House Valerian symbolism, which I couldn't really fit in earlier without breaking the narrative flow. So I'm adding them here as a kind of bonus. You may recall that the Valerians of Driftmark have a wooden throne, one made of driftwood, which reminds us at once of both the Driftwood crowns of the Ironborn and Grey King's Weirwood throne of Naga's Jaws. The Driftwood throne is a wooden throne that came from the sea, just as Grey King's Weirwood Sea Dragon Jaws throne is. Once again, with the green sea word play in mind, this all makes more sense. A wooden throne always makes us think of a Weirwood throne of a green seer, and the idea of the Valerian's Driftwood throne coming from the sea, from the Merlin King himself, according to the legend, now reads as a throne which is tied to the green sea, a wooden throne which is tied to the green sea, which brings us now, uh, which brings us back to weirwood thrones again. Now, the story of how the Valerians got this wooden throne and the rest of the island is pretty great, even though it's only one line in the world of ice and fire. It just says the ancient driftwood throne, the high seat of the Valerians, which legend claims was given to them by the Merlin king to conclude a pact. No, I'm not sure if the Merlings were living on Driftmark and the Valerians wiped them out, or if the first Valerians just had a habit of bartering with Merlings for furniture, or if this is more likely just a strange case of the more modern Valerians becoming wrapped up in a much older local myth about a Driftwood throne and a Merlin king. But consider this legend as a possible allegory to the history of the Iron Islands. It goes something like this. The Iron Islands, like Driftmark, used to be inhabited by fish people. But at some point, dragon people came by sea and conquered the fish people, intermarried with them, and sat in their wooden, th wooden chair. In doing so, they became sea dragons, green seers. The Grey King is the dragon-blooded pirate from Ashai who conquered the Iron Islands and sat in the probably weirwood throne of Naga's Jaws very comparable to the idea of the Valerians coming from Valeria to conquer the Merlings and take the Wooden Throne from their Merlin King. Uh, the Driftwood Throne from their Merlin King. Is this the story of the Iron Islands? Well, perhaps, perhaps. It certainly seems like a detailed allegory which matches our interpretations of the legend so far. And there's yet another echo of it right here in the history of the Dothraki Sea. Remember those fisher queens who ruled the Silver Sea from their floating palace? Well, according to legend, a great warrior hero conspicuously named Hushor Amai forged a new nation called Sarnor from the people of the grasslands. 
and he was supposedly the last descendant of the Fisher Queens. Hughes Hor Ami is an obvious Azor Ahai callout in some sense, and here is a conqueror using the name of the Fisher Queens to make a new throne for himself, ruling over the sea that the Fisher Queens once ruled. For what it's worth, the idea of Hughes Hor Ami as some sort of Azor Ahai echo is strengthened when you look at the name of the last hero king of the Sarnori, who is also an Azor Ahai echo. His name is Mazor Alexi. Who's whore and Mazor and Azor, Amai and Alexi and Ahai. These two Sarnori kings, who sound so much like Azor Ahai, ruled over the Dothraki Sea and the three great lakes, which were the remnants of the Silver Sea. Oh, and those Sarnori? They were expert breeders and riders of horses, whose great weapon of war was their cavalry, who always went to war, who always went to battle in war chariots. So, they were seahorse lords, just like the Dothraki. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm dying, Sandry. Like, I can't. I'm missing something. Fun. <laughs> I oh, he's so derpy. It's perfect. I know. It's like, she's, it's like the eyes were great. And then she added the eyebrows. Like, I've, I've been trying so hard to keep like a straight face. So it doesn't look like I'm just laughing at you the whole time. I, but I, just, I was like, missing it totally. I was just I doing my thing. Handle it. <laughs> <laughs> this is so amazing, Sandra. I love you so much. This is everything I wanted. <laughs> oh, I'm going to need a second. <laughs> Oh man, I'm like crying. <laughs> like, I just love how you can hit these different notes, you know? Right? <laughs> like, oh, I love it. Danny's looking extra beautiful and aloof. <laughs> and the seahorse is just like, <laughs> and she just got oh, the sea bare legs. <laughs> That's and exactly the gone. voice I think of it in. Oh man. He's doing his best. He's trying <laughs> with okay. his. See unicorn horse. Yeah, he even threw in a uh, a unicorn for for good measure. So. Oh man, this is del utterly delightful. This is the okay. Best. It's time to get serious, guys. I'm gonna leave this. I'm gonna leave this up on the screen. I'm gonna talk very seriously and expect <laughs> everyone to pay attention. Good luck. So, the second loose end, which actually goes back to Weird Compendium Six, also leads us back to House Valerian. Uh, it's the idea of a green-eyed Valerian or a green-eyed dragon-blooded person. If you recall, Danny saw a vision of the gemstone emperors who had hair of gold, silver, and platinum white, and one of them had eyes of jade. I asked, what does this represent? Maybe a green-eyed dragon person? Well, I really wanted to save all the House Valerian stuff for one episode, so I didn't go any further into this then. But we do have one example of a green-eyed dragon person in the main story, who is, of course, draped in sea dragon and green dragon symbolism. That would be Orain Waters, the bastard of Driftmark, who is the half-brother to Monford Valerian, Lord of the Tides, and a master of Driftmark. This is from a Circe chapter of A Feast for Crows. That's you, I got. I, I know, I got distracted by Sandra. Pay attention. <laughs> Take it. I'm setting a bad example. <clears throat> Marjorie was dancing with her cousin, Ala, Mega with Sir Talad the Tall. The other cousin, Eleanor, was sharing a cup of wine with the handsome young bastard of Driftmark, Alrain Waters. It was not the first time the queen had made note of Waters, a lean young man with gray-green eyes and long silver-gold hair. The first time she had seen him, for half a heartbeat she had almost thought Rhaegar Targaryen had returned from the ashes. It is his hair, she told herself. He is not half as comely as Rhaegar was. His face is too narrow, and he has that cleft in his chin. The Valarians came from old Valyrian stock, however, and some had the same silvery hair as the dragon kings of old. Oh man, there's just so much here. I mean, we've mentioned that Rhaegar returned from the ashes symbolism because that we've seen that somewhere else, actually. Uh, because, and that implies Rhaegar as an Azor Ahai dragon figure being reborn from the Weirwoods, which are symbolic burning ash trees. You can see why this fits nicely with the stuff from the Devil in the Gre Deep Green Sea, where we saw Rhaegar symbolically reborn as two different green seer figures. Rhaegal, the green dragon, as well as Rhaegal, the stallion who mounts the world, 
who has a lot of green seer symbolism. Now we can add a third resurrected Rhaegar, as Rhaegar is figuratively reborn as Orain Waters, who the blood of the dra uh, who combines the blood of the dragon lords via his Valer Valerian heritage with the gray green eyes and the name Waters. Pretty good stuff. It goes well beyond that, of course. Cersei named him Grand Admiral of the Royal Fleet, enhancing his sea dragon symbolism. Then later he betrays her and sets him up, sets himself up as a pirate lord in the Stepstones, calling himself Lord of the Waters, which makes him a Merlin King, Grey King, Sea Lord figure. And of course, remember, he has gray green eyes. A dragon lord of the waters, setting himself up as a pirate around Bloodstone Island. Well, that sounds familiar. It reminds us of Bela Targaryen's father, Daemon Targaryen, who named himself King of the Narrow Sea and took Bloodstone Island for his seat. He was basically a glorified pirate, though. He drove out all the old pirates and promptly began charging tariffs and taxes for any who wanted to traverse the Stepstones. Point being, Orain has some nice Azor High pirate lord symbolism to go along with his sea dragon symbolism. Other pirate lord versions of Azor High include Daemon Targaryen, who we just mentioned, Euron Greyjoy, who needs no introduction as a Bloodstone Emperor figure, the Red Kraken, Dalton Greyjoy, who carries the Valyrian steel sword Nightfall with its moonstone pommel, and who gained his nickname when he once took a dozen wounds and emerged from the fight drenched from head to heel in blood. And of course, there's the Grey King, the pirate lord from Ashai, who sailed to Westeros in a weirwood boat. Or maybe he flew by dragon and then built a weirwood boat in Westeros. We'll sort that out another time. But the point is, he's a pirate lord, Azor High person, just like Orain Waters, the lord of the waters with gray-green eyes and a dragonish look. Now that we understand the green sea, green seer thing, all of these pirate lord Azor High people suddenly seem to be reinforcing the message that Azor High went into and seemingly came out of the weirwood net and they can probably be considered kings of the Weirwood Nets. We have to look at the Merlin King against uh, the Merlin King stuff again too, because, well, there's Wyman Manderley and the Merman's Court. Yes, we'll get there. In any case, Azor Ahai can probably be considered to be not only a king of the Weirwood Net, but a usurper king of the Weirwood Net. All of these pirate kings were clear usurpers. Daemon Targaryen's older brother Viserys I Targaryen was the official king of the Seven Kingdoms when Daemon named himself King of the Narrow Sea. Dalton Greyjoy rose in rebellion with Daemon Blackfire's, uh, I'm sorry, with Daemon Targaryen's Blacks during the Dance of the Dragons and then refused to stop reaving once the dance was concluded. Euron Greyjoy is a given. He is rising in rebellion against the very gods themselves, let alone making a claim for the Iron Throne pretty soon here. And even the Grey King is a kind of usurper in the sense that we hear he had a leal elder brother from whom House Goodbrother descends. Why wasn't the older brother the king? I don't know. But we don't. We aren't told. But in this sense, Grey King is a younger brother who took the throne, just like the Bloodstone Emperor himself. All of this points to Azor High as a usurper of the Weirwood Net, which is important enough to make a big point of it here. It's one of the running questions we've been trying to answer. Did Azor High force his way into the Weirwood Net? possibly against the will of the trees? I'd say the answer is increasingly looking like a yes. So that's pretty cool, right? It's a good uh, good use of the pirate symbol. Oh my God. <laughs> Nobody heard anything I just said. You're gonna have to be listen. No, no, because I've just, yep, we've just been watching these <laughs> unfold. It's like... I didn't realize she was gonna draw five of them. It's a storm of seagulls. <laughs> A storm of the sea. Next book. <laughs> oh my gosh. What were you doing to me? Oh my god. And I made there was a moment when I realized that the little stubby wings could be like little T-Rex arms. And so I just want like imagining these little derpy sea dragons trying to like fly around with a little stubby wings and it just they're, like... doing, they're all doing their best collectively. <laughs> I think this one, like he was supposed to be like flat against the tank, like just pressing his face into it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're just they're all so special they're just they're very they're special i love them oh, i can't even speak i can't <laughs> even speak <laughs> i'm sorry you opened the door 
<laughs> That's what happens when you ask the seahorse. Oh, like, man. Oh, like, you I'm like seriously, one. like, crying. <laughs> so like great. The, the two in the upper right that have the very elongated mouths. This one? <laughs> yeah. But the uh, the two from straight on are really great, too. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. Oh. So, guys, what can I say? Just like you have to listen to A Song of Ice and Fire, you're going to have to re-listen to that last section uh, with, with, like, cover up the window. So you don't, <laughs> you don't, <laughs> minimize the window, turn the sound up. Uh, and because... Uh, it's really interesting what I was talking about with the pirates and stuff. Uh, and pirates are fun, but damn, dude. Yeah. <laughs> San Rixian got me, dude. She won up me for sure. Oh. Thank you. I am well pleased. I'm well oh, pleased. <laughs> I keep my job another day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, they're Durgans because they're <laughs> derpy. Those oh, they're Durgans. so derpy. They're just, <laughs> just, they're just so adorable. Oh. Uh, yeah, who was it? Someone, I think it was Huntress of the Wolf's Wood said Derpy the Sea, sea Dragon could be our new mascot. I saw that. Yeah, I was dying. Derpy I've, the Sea Dragon. <laughs> Derpy the Sea Dragon. I'm, oh my gosh. Go back oh. to the first one, Sanry. Oh. With Danny. Yes. <laughs> That's Derpy the Sea Dragon. Oh, Derpy the Sea Dragon. I love Derpy. <laughs> And then all those other ones are like his family. That's yeah, like the that's, family reunion. That's his family. They all come. <laughs> they come to say hi. And they see every once in a while. He's very. I'm just, just imagining them as like the names of like various Valarians. Like you could do some great caricatures of of Valarian characters with like <laughs> as like derpy sea dragon. The sneak neck. I'm just gonna have to turn the stream off. I can't. <laughs> This is bad television, but I can't. Yay. I can't say anything. I'm, I'm Corliss Valarian. The, the <laughs> okay, we'll stick around long enough to see the sea snake. Give him like, <laughs> give him like a wig, a silver wig, like I wear, like a really overdone wig. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! She's giving him your glasses too. I'm the sea snake. Okay. I'm in charge of stuff. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm oh my gosh, I can't breathe. Oh. I know, I'm having a hard time. <laughs> I'm under the sea, I can't breathe. Oh man. <clears throat> I haven't even like smoked anything and I like <laughs> am just losing my shit here. My I think my brain is leaking out of my ears in like the best way because this is great. That's oh melting. my god. <laughs> symbolism coming I'm full circle. So glad I could bring you so much joy, Gretchen. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. It's I think like... everybody's enjoying this. <laughs> I haven't done goofy <laughs> drawings for a while. So your goofy drawings are always just so amazing. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm composing myself. I'm calm. Managing calm the stream. Like, calm like still water. Calm like still water. Ooh. White as a shadow. All right. <laughs> wow. Okay. <clears throat> oh. Oh, this is this is Lord Monfred Valerion, Lord of the Tides. I sell the pride of Driftmark. <laughs> I was hoping you would give it like catfish, like whatever you call those. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. I paint my entire ship silver because I'm so magnificent. Yes, I even have silver oars because I'm so special. Clean the mud off the oars, sir. I need to see the silver of my oars. So I'm Lord Monfred Valerion. He's got really tiny little flappers. He doesn't do so well out of the water. No, no. <laughs> just like little itty bitty fins. He's got like jazz fins, like jazz hands. That's all he can do. It's just... Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. You got to jazz hand your way through the water. <laughs> Somebody said he was an accountant, so he's getting a shirt now. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Oh. Oh, Sanri, I love you. You are such a delight. You really are. This is 
Oh, man. Oh, you know, just take a real serious stream and topic and draw some shitty seahorses. <laughs> Well, like I said, it was, you know, it's it's a really it was a really fun essay. Um, it, there wasn't really a new idea. It was more like taking the the Nissa Nissa becomes the Green Sea idea and just pounding the nail in on that one because I've been sure of it for a long time. Uh, but but between the last like three essays, I feel like everybody should be pretty confident in this idea now that Nissa Nissa not only dies and goes into the trees, but like alters the weirwood net creates the weirwood net or something along those lines her the entire weirwood net is akin to her consciousness and mind and so that's that's essentially the message of this but uh, all the seahorse symbolism is just delightfully fun it's like this round robin when i found sea smoke i about lost my shit i was like oh geez the horse is like sea smoke and danny's a dragon riding a seahorse and alan's a seahorse riding a dragon and he goes to the God's eye and I was like, oh man, this is, this is just great. So hope you guys enjoyed that and had fun. Um, even before obviously all the fun drawings. <laughs> oh, he's writing boobs on the calculator. That's very mature, very mature Monfred. <laughs> Shouldn't it be Monfred. upside down though? Oh no, I guess it's. Uh, yeah, maybe depending yeah. on how you read the eights. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, Monfred. Oh, yeah. I guess I could do a ride the snake. <laughs> End stream. Go. End stream. <laughs> nice. <clears throat> well, I see. Yeah, we've had 150 going strong the whole way. So I really appreciate that, guys. Appreciate all the continued support. Uh, I had some new patrons signing up in the last couple months. That's really nice. I know Christmas time is tough. There's always a natural constriction around the holidays. Got to buy all the kitties presents and stuff. So appreciate those of you who have jumped on recently and uh, all you guys coming out, sending in super chats and all that stuff. So I have fun doing all this, especially when Sanry draws derpy sea dragons. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, what can I say? Tons of fun. Looking forward to, like I said, next week, it's going to be on the Between Two Weirwoods channel. <laughs> <laughs> next week on between two werewolves we're gonna fight some seahorses oh fuck <laughs> you just gave me the like dramatic zoom in on this the derpiest one how am i supposed to talk <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> i can't look <laughs> This is my mouth. Henry, you need to make like a just like an image of that, and then you could like post it in random like Twitter streams, <laughs> like Twitter, like when someone's being like ridiculous only, on Twitter. The only way I can combat this is with the patch face helm. So <laughs> I got nothing. I'm on just the between in. on the between two weirwoods channel. Damn it, we are going to talk about Memory Sorrow and Thorn, which is a series by Tad Williams. This is kind of gray areas brainchild go subscribe to gray areas youtube channel if you don't already i assume you already do i'll also be joined by aziz and bookshelf stud make sure you're subscribed to the between two weirwoods channel and now back to derpy seahorses <laughs> i can talk like a human um i am baal the bard you can find me on youtube as baal the bard um or you can find me on twitter as at gn ellis writer um, my website is gnls.com. I talk a lot about um, disempowered and disinherited women. I am currently working on some something a little bit different uh, just because I've been I've had some family stuff to take care of. So um, getting my getting my groove back. So the next essay is going to be talking with some stuff about the others. And then I might do fire and blood and then I will do uh, Cersei. The Amethyst Empress Queen Cersei. So nice. Well, me. I will look forward to having you back on after those are out to discuss because it, of course, dovetails so nicely with uh, with a lot of the mystical mythical astronomy stuff that I've looked into. So yes, thanks for joining us, Gretchen. You, by the way, I think this is the first time I've had you do quote readings. It's true. You have, you have a great reading voice. Oh, thank you. My compliments. I was uh, not. Uh, I mean, uh, 
Not that I expected you wouldn't do well, but you did really well. So thank Wait, you. you thought I talked like this when I was reading the quotes. <laughs> that's how my seahorse talks. Yes, that's exactly what I thought. I was, <laughs> I was like, oh god, this is gonna I'm a sea dragon. <laughs> I'm a sea dragon. No, Hi, you, everybody. Hey. you have you did you did very well, put a lot of emotion into the readings, and I appreciated that. And so did everyone else. I so do have a background you. in theater, so ah. You're always so qualified. <laughs> I did theater in like high school and all sorts of. I just do random things, is what that is. I do all sorts of random things. Well, so I've once estimated that of the, the like the Song of Ice and Fire fandom, uh, you know, that hangs out on the internet and talks about it and stuff, probably close to half of us are writers, right? So, like, yep. what's the percentage that, you know, did some theater in high school at least? Um, I'd probably say 30 to 40% of us, I think, probably did at least something. Yeah, I, I did a little in high school, so. Yeah, a lot of people do. <clears throat> I used to have fun imitating. Um, I mimic voices, and so my my siblings would have me, like, mimic voices on TV and stuff, because it was fun. It's definitely where a lot of people practice. And then uh, San Rixian of the Derp, derp Gons, the Sea Derpkins. <laughs> I just saw the one that's peeking over the Derpy Dragon's shoulder. <laughs> it's his child. <laughs> He's got a child that's even, oh even derpier than him. This is a little, little Sea Dragon nugget there. For There's an actual horse, seahorse. Oh. Derp horses, that's what they are. Derp horses. Thank yes. you. Meet you, Cam. Oh. With the super chat and the right name, Derp Horses. Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. <sighs> little little oh. derps. Little derpies. Those are okay. So Sandry, where can we find you? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm Sanrixian, Lord of the Derp Dragons. And you can find me on Twitter at Sanrixian. And yeah, that's pretty much me. Mm. <laughs> oh my god. I'm, I'm just sorry. I'm gonna need like like a while to like settle what is happening right now because I know I, I just need to go sit on the couch and relax. <laughs> this is like see Durgans. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> of course he's got a unicorn to keep you guys company. You know, yeah. Where are those eyes looking? Nobody knows. One's good looking at New York. The other one's looking at L.A. All right. Well, Sanri, you took a week off to get to get healthy and you came back in, in force. So thank you very much. Uh, can we see the earlier masterpiece one more time? Of course. <clears throat> oh, man, that's this sizzling. Is serious drawing. That's so is, gorgeous. Is that a calendar piece or no? Uh, maybe. I'm finishing it up tonight, so... I was just wondering, is it too mythical astronomy symbolism based to be the calendar piece or? Yeah, I'm thinking so. It'll probably be more of a mythical astronomy piece than a calendar piece because it's a little bit trippy where the calendar is a little bit more literal. Can you can you make pretty much any of these detailed pieces available as a print on your website or does it take some effort to make something uh, viable as a print? Well, I just ordered them. And, um, I did pre-orders on my last batch of prints, which were pretty much all of the mythical astronomy pieces that I've painted from Stan Stephanie up to Waymore Royce and even Good Queen Alisane and Jaharis. Uh, it takes about two weeks to get them to me. Um, I go through a really nice website where they're like archival print quality so that they don't fade or anything over time if you frame them. But it doesn't take much. All I need is a request to do it and I'll print some off. Yes. Did that make sense? Yep. Awesome. <laughs> cool. All yeah, right. My well, out soon. Hopefully, either tonight or tomorrow. Yeah. So hop on that, guys. Um, there you go. Stay tuned for sandrixian.com. Follow sandrixian on Twitter at sandrixian, uh, and we will, of course, be talking all about it uh, as soon as those are available, as soon as the calendar is ready. So. There you go, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, sandrixian, so much for adding everything. To the show today thank you gretchen for your readings and your company <clears throat> you are welcome thanks for having me all right and thank you all for joining us and i will see you next week on the between two weirwoods channel cheers bye, bye.